people often that they use the phrase playing god uh <laughs> i'm being an atheist of course i have to sort of like rephrase that in my head uh, and uh and my, my usual response is uh is uh then um well you know um uh, humans played devil uh you know since europeans arrived uh in australia uh they played the devil for for quite a long time uh and uh, caused an awful lot of damage so maybe it's about time we actually started playing god to actually reverse some of that damage that was done this is a conversation about synthetic biology and genetic biocontrols with Stephen Frankenberg from the University of Melbourne in Australia. We discuss what I think is one of the most exciting research programs currently being carried out in the world today. That is, using advanced gene editing techniques to eradicate invasive pests and to bring back extinct species. I'm Shane Farnsworth, and this is the Escape Sapiens podcast. If you enjoy these conversations and want to help support me, the best way you can do so is by liking, sharing, and subscribing. And now, here's Stephen Frankenberg. I hope you enjoy. Escaped Sapiens. I'm going to begin somewhere pretty simple. What is genetic biocontrol and why does Australia need it? Right. Um, I might start with the second part of the question first. Uh, genetic, uh, why does Australia need it? Um, well, uh, Australia probably has, well, along with New Zealand, perhaps the two countries that have the worst problem with uh, invasive pests. Uh, you know, when when Europeans arrived and they just brought every possible animal they could and released it that they thought might sort of make them feel more at home. And it's pretty much a rule of thumb that if you introduce uh, a, a novel species into a new environment where it hasn't evolved, it will either not make it or it will establish itself and compete um, in a detrimental way with what other species are already, are already there, whether it's out competing them for resources or whether it's acting as a predator, you can be pretty sure that it's going to cause some knock-on imbalance. And that's just what's happened um, left, right and centre in the Australian environment. Um, that is a, it's generally accepted that that most of the loss of uh, biodiversity that's co- that's happened in Australia is uh, caused by two, the two main factors would be habitat loss and invasive species. Um, at least uh, habitat loss is um, is kind of uh, reversible. You can restore habitat with a lot of political will, obviously. Uh, but once you, but it's always been accepted that um, that all the invasive species is kind of irreversible. Uh, once mm-hmm. you have them there, you'll never really get rid of them, and you're you're just sort of, you know, treading water by by trying to keep the numbers down. Um, it's whack a mole. And um, whereas genetic biocontrol, uh, sort of since that was sort of or the idea of the, the, the possibility that it could be used uh, to actually potentially even eradicate populations or at least keep them down in a sustainable um, way, um, self, in a self-sustaining way long term that will basically um, minimise or um, the any significant impact on the native environment, natural environment. Oh, then the other part of the question is what is genetic biocontrol? Uh, and so that is essentially doing any kind of a uh, genetic edit or genetic alteration uh, in uh, a species genome uh, that will be heritable and therefore just conv- confined to that species. Or, um, uh, I mean, if, if, if it's able to hybridize with another species, then, then you know, closely related species. But in, in the case of invasive pests, that's not really a consideration generally, um, with the one exception of feral dogs, you could say um, hybridizing with dingoes. Uh, it, it, it basically a, a genetic alteration that will um, cause an impact on on the uh, population of that particular species in that environment. I think that would be a fairly uh, encompassing definition. But so, what's the scale of devastation in Australia? So, why what what do we see? What what have we lost? Yeah, I mean, the okay, I don't have the figures right in front of me, but they're usually you know estimated in the order of I'm trying to remember something like. Um, uh, it, it's in the order of billions per year uh, when when you take into account um, agricultural loss of agricultural productivity, which is an easy, sort of more obvious way of quantifying it. Um, it's more difficult, obviously, to to um, cost uh, in, in money terms the loss of uh, biodiversity. You know, impact on you know, say tourism because of the you know loss of um, uh, fauna and that sort of thing, but uh, but also uh, another factor to consider is the 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 cost of management of of those invasive species. Now it's not just the, what they're impacting on, but it's the the cost of actually maintaining, and that's a massive cost. And it's it's yeah, plenty of independent studies have estimated that as being in the order of you know more than a billion dollars a year. And I think it's 
something like um, $60 billion in today's terms since the 1960s. I think I'm re remembering that figure right. Um, so it's a lot of money. And and so any investment in um, a genetic biocontrol uh, that can actually eradicate a species, you would think even just in investing $100 million to get rid of a species um, population is is a no-brainer when you consider mm -hmm. what the you know the actual cost is for not doing anything. So are we doing that then? Are we putting uh, so forward that money? There's not a lot so far in Australia. So um, yeah, there's probably only two or three labs in Australia that are actually working on vertebrate genetic biocontrol. Um, there's you know there's some stuff being done on invertebrates like insects and so forth. And globally, uh, you know, for mosquitoes from malaria, that's that's a huge um, you know global kind of effort that's sort of starting to pick up steam and i predict that that will probably solve malaria in the next decade i would think mm -hmm. i don't i don't really sort of um you know follow that particular field um vertebrate is uh, vertebrate biology is more my area but um but yeah it, but for vertebrate genetic biocontrol i mean that's most countries are not so invested in that and so i kind of got interested in it about about four four years ago i think i think i sort of started becoming more aware of um the, the technology or the the um, potential for the technology and just started one, wondering why is our government not putting you know pouring hundreds of millions of dollars into this it just seems like a no-brainer why, why aren't they doing it and I just thought eventually they're going to you know start investing it um so I thought well I'll start working in that area now because I know that's that's where things inevitably have to go uh and so I started working on it and sort of you know started working on little sort of side projects and and um and you know reading and um, sort of getting my head around it all working out what needed to be done what the best priorities were um for progressing the field and and just through all that doing that i got a, a, a small um grant uh, the first one i got was actually from uh, rabbit free australia foundation they gave me a small grant just to sort of get started which was just a you know a good boost and uh and then uh, i was lucky enough to to get a, a major federal department of ag grant um mm -hmm. So it was a funding call um, looking for um, uh, projects on genetic biocontrol as well as uh, any any sort of strategies for tackling um, vertebrate pests, and uh, and then luckily uh, got that grant and that uh, that's what got my lab going working in that particular field. Uh, mm. yeah. But so your main interest is in gene drives, right? That's the main technology that you're interested in applying. What does the gene drive do? How how do you okay. use that to eradicate yeah. animals? Yeah, yeah. So, so a gene drive is is basically a um, a genetic trick for distorting the way genes are normally inherited. So, normally we have, as most people would know, uh, we have um, basically our our whole genome is kind of in duplicate. We have two copies of of you know, every gene in our body, or two two you know, a, a duplicate set of chromosomes in our body. Uh, one set that we get from our mother, and one set that we get from our father. And then and then when we pass on our genetic um, uh material to the to the next generation to our offspring uh then then only half of uh, only one of each of those genes uh of those two copies of each, each gene that we have will be passed on to our offspring so it's a 50 percent chance uh let's and and there's often the sort of variations between each of those genes which is called alleles so you have two alternative alleles sometimes of a particular gene so an allele let's say allele um a that you get got from your father and um and another version allele b of that same gene that you got from your mother so the your offspring then will have a 50 percent. so you carry both allele a and allele b your any one of your offspring will only have a 50 percent chance of inheriting say allele a and a 50 percent chance of inheriting allele b let's say we we knock a gene drive into allele a one of the copies of that gene um then then that uh, uh probability of being inherited then uh can well ideally is going to be 100 percent, and and allele b can't be inherited so only allele A will be inherited, and then all of the offspring uh, will have allele A or the gene drive um, version of that allele. Um, and so um, the way it does that, well, with the um, the sort of the the design of the CRISPR of, of, a, of, a, of a gene drive, which is sort of you know the sort of more popular kind of design, uh, is actually exploits CRISPR. So CRISPR um, was the advent of CRISPR was about well, how many years ago now? Um, six six or seven years ago. Probably longer um, is, is simply a tool for for cutting DNA. It will cut DNA at a precise location, and you can program where it will cut. And so, the way a gene drive actually 
Um, so it actually copies itself. So it actually kills off the other version of the gene, the other allele that, that doesn't have the gene drive. And it gets replaced with a second copy of the gene drive. And it does that by using CRISPR to cut that second wild type or, or normal allele of the gene. And then um, once that DNA has been cut at that location that you've sp specified uh, in the sort of programming of the CRISPR, uh, then the, the the gene drive will be used as a template to basically repair that break in the DNA in the chromosome. Mm -hmm. And and so that that and this is a natural. DNA repair mechanism that all cells are using all the time. Whenever uh, in, in our bodies where, you know, double-stranded breaks are happening all the time, you know, from UV radiation from the sun, you know, causes DNA damage and that sort of thing. There's constantly DNA repair mechanisms that are going on, um, repairing all of these, these breaks all the time and keeping our cells healthy. This is just normal sort of you know, way of living for, for cells. And so it actually exploits those natural DNA repair mechanisms to actually repair the DNA. And it can do it either one of two ways. It can sort of do it just by stitching together the break, you know, where it occurred. And often it'll lose a little bit of, you know, of the sequence of, of the DNA at that break. And that can cause a mutation. Or it can use a template to basically repair it. And that depends on, on the similarity of the sequence either side of that break that's basically shared between those you know, two copies of the gene, those two alleles of the gene, it actually relies on that that identity between the sequences either side of the break. It's basically the mechanism that it uses in the cells. And so, yeah, so then basically, if, the, if, if this is sort of um, programmed to occur <clears throat> in the germ cells, so these are the cells that produce sperm and eggs, um, then uh, then then basically all of all of the sperm, um, every sperm will contain uh, a copy of that um, gene drive allele and not the wild type allele. But how and so it... the the yeah, sorry. It... Uh, I, go, go on. I was going to explain then how that 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 then goes on to spread through the population. Then right, because obviously... that's, that's my question, right? Yeah. If this if yeah. this is something yeah. that leads to infertility, then how does that dominate mm. in a population? Okay, yeah. So so the gene drive basically um, is designed to spread through the population exponentially because it'll keep on copying itself. Then the second feature you need to add uh, to the gene drive design uh, in order to achieve population control is to target a fertility gene and specifically you want to target a female fertility gene uh, not not a male fertility gene and the reason for that is if if you've got you know if you've made all of the males in a population uh, infertile except for one uh, and uh, then that one remaining male is capable of you know, mating with all of the females that are remaining, and it has no impact on the on the population at all. So, if you want to control population, you have to target the females. The, the, the number of females is essentially a measure of what that population size is. So, you only need to target the, uh, well, you only want to target the the female fertility because you want the males to be fertile to keep on spreading that gene drive through the population. So, any remaining females that are still fertile in the population, uh, then there, there's an increasing probability each generation that they'll mate with a gene drive male because the number of gene drives is increasing exponentially mm. um, in the population within the male part of the population. And then, you know, and then uh, eventually you end up with a population that has only gene drive males and no fertile females and it would crash. Uh, and, um, you know, in theory, you would you might think it would go extinct, but there are some sort of caveats uh, to add to that. And that's, that's basically due to the fact that populations uh, across the landscape don't tend to be um, uniformly distributed. They're they're sort of patchy. You'll get sort of pockets of ideal habitat where where there are more individuals there, and then you'll have a bit of a, a gap where there aren't many, and then another patch where the, where you know it's good for for that species, and there are more of them. And so uh, a gene drive might sort of wipe out a local population, and then the gene drive itself goes extinct because there's no animals left, and uh, or it might some animals might get to another lo you know localized population with the gene drive, but then meanwhile that that little bit of habitat might then get invaded by you know an animal dispersing from another local population and repopulate it and then and so you've got this sort of you know chasing effect going on mm -hmm. so there's a lot of modeling population modeling work that's done uh to to figure out how how optimally you, you would deploy a gene drive in the environment where you whether you'd have to sort of how many individuals you would have to release across the landscape to try to make sure that you saturate the entire population. So depending on the, what the sort of population structure is um, of the species across the landscape, uh, it, it may it may require a high investment to actually 
achieve eradication or it's possible that it may not be possible for some species and you but in, in it uh, there will still be a great benefit because you'll you'll maintain that long-term suppression of the population so you know let's say it's a, a rabbit population you know if you can maintain the rabbit population across australia just to 10 percent of of you know of what it is currently that can be enough to basically you know stop the rabbits from competing so um intensively with with all of the other um, native uh, Australian marsupial species that they basically compete with for the same resources. So it could be enough really for all those species to recover. If gene drives are so dominant, why don't you see them naturally occurring and then just completely overtaking a species DNA? It, it does, right. What's the protection? Yes. <laughs> so there are there are naturally occurring um, gene drives that are not CRISPR based that that basically um, they so there there has been actually one that's been exploited recently by um, uh, one of the uh, the uh, pretty much the only other lab in Australia that's working on vertebrate gene drive. This is Paul Thomas in Adelaide, uh, who's working on rodents, and he's actually um, sort of recently sort of published and um, and sort of demonstrated um, the, um, the uh, a gene drive that works in mice, uh, and it's using this um, natural gene drive um, called um, the it's the T locus or, or um, uh, of uh, position on the on the chromosome and it's basically affects the way sort of sperm sort of develop uh and uh sort of the cytoplasmic bridges that occur between sort of sperm cells and uh and it actually does um act as a gene drive but it's not as efficient as an ideal crispr based gene drive and there is a there is a sort of a cost to the fertility of the males as well that have this gene drive so it's not a it's not a perfectly functioning gene drive. It's enough that it can cause populations to sort of crash a bit locally, but then they'll sort of inevitably re recover because there is a cost to it. So, um, so yeah. So I mean that, and and probably in other species there are naturally occurring gene drives that just haven't been discovered yet. But they're not. Yeah, they they tend would tend to have their limitations. And you know, it may be that that um, during evolutionary um, history. There have been gene drives that have wiped out populations, but of course we don't know about them because they, you know, it went extinct, you know, 1.3 million years ago, and it just happened that it <laughs> went through the population and that, and that was it. So it's it's hard to find. I mean, it's almost by definition uh, virtually uh, impossible or extremely unlikely that we would um, uncover or discover a gene drive in a natural population that is destined to drive that population to extinction because it probably would have done it by now um, if it were that efficient. Uh, so yeah, I think there's a sort of a, a philosophical principle associated with that, uh, that <laughs> sort, sort of, of idea. But yeah, uh, isn't it, is the yeah anyway. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, yeah. So um, the, there's um, and whereas the CRISPR sort of based gene drive, um, because I mean a lot a, a, often people sort of you know they come back to the gene when they sort of want to sort of uh, dismiss the, the gene drives as being, um, you know, ever likely to be useful. They say, oh, nature always finds a way. Uh, and, but to which I would just say that, well, uh, in, in terms of like diseases, you, you like for, you know, viruses and, and infections and things like that, sure. Uh, you know, new diseases can, can you know, devastate a population, but then, you know, immunity de develops in the population. But, but species have have co-evolved with with pathogens and and uh, you know diseases and things for for billions of years, and so it's nothing really new. It's just that particular virus is different. But you know, um, all species have evolved to basically deal with with new things like that, and they get through it. There'll be a population crash, but they'll they'll figure out a way. CRISPR, um, a CRISPR-based gene drive is is completely new. It's it's like no no animals have ever you know been faced because this is something that's very very deliberately designed and engineered by humans in a completely unique way. Um, CRISPR itself was originally from bacteria, um, was, you know, discovered in bacteria and it's part of the bacterial immune system. But then, uh, but it, it's never had any sort of, um, it's it, it's never been used by bacteria to uh, attack, you know, vertebrates or any, <laughs> anything like that. It's, it's it not, it's not part of the, uh, you know, the, the, um, artillery of, of of a bacterial cell to a, a, attack vertebrates using CRISPR and so vertebrates have not needed to evolve um, or animals have not needed to evolve a way of combating a CRISPR based attack mm -hmm. uh, and so and so the mechanism is simply not there so um, yeah so I, th I think it's 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 
negligible chance that there would be um, a resistance. There are other there are other caveats to gene drive design. So there are there are ways that resistance could emerge to a particular gene drive. Um, so so when I mentioned earlier about DNA repair can occur um, by you know, a couple of different mechanisms. One, it just stitches together the the break in the DNA and it can leave a little gap. If um, that occurs when when the gene drive is is you know copying itself, if if instead of using the template of the gene drive allele, it just repairs itself with that um, just at that break, and if that if that little repair doesn't disrupt the function of that gene, um, then um, that gene you know will remain functional, maintain the fertility of that of that uh, of that female, um, but then it actually becomes a, a resistant allele to the gene drive because that mm. specific sequence where the cut was has been altered, and that that sequence has to remain intact oh. for the gene drive to actually be able to cut there in, in subsequent. So that creates a resistance allele. But then there's a, a way around that is that you instead of just having one cut site. You actually program so the way you program the, the the cut sites for the CRISPR is you have these sort of short sequences called guide RNAs that are sort of expressed by your your gene drive that are little sort of short twenty base sort of sequence that perfectly matches you know a particular site that you design it to and so you'd have multiple of those sites within the fertility gene so you might have like you know five different sites or something like that and so it will cut at all of those sites and so uh, and then and then it's the 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 sequence that's Planking that will that will be used as the template to sort of repair it, um, and um, but if it uses that that sort of stitching together mechanism, it'll have deleted so much of the fertility gene that there's no chance that that fertility gene is going to be functional. So you know you, you, there are these certain things you've got to take into account in in, in the design. Uh, it's 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 a little bit more complex. But d does that also increase the that that sort of approach? Does that increase the chance that you also have offsite targeting? it's sort of like a shotgun approach uh, you mean approach. elsewhere in the genome yeah um it's it's uh, yeah i mean um the guide rnas are, are can be designed quite specifically i mean they're, they're i mean the, the sort of concern with off target effects most of that concern with off target effects um is more in the realm of you know in therapeutic medicine sort of stuff hmm. because when you've got therapeutic medicine obviously the you know the your the bar of you know how cautious you have to be is is much higher because you don't want if you're treating patients with with off target um you know with with um crispr uh off target effects could have a you know could cause cancer or something like that uh you know in rare instances but often enough that it becomes um um you know unacceptable as a as a therapeutic medicine when we're talking about you know wildlife mm. you know if 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 one percent of our target species uh you know develops a, a tumor in the embryo because of an off-target effect well you know that's <laughs> it's you're it's, trying it's, to eradicate we're, we're trying anyway. to get rid of the spe species yeah. anyway exactly exactly so it's it's not a really a significant consideration um you, unless there are so many off off target effects that it's just that the embryo is not even developing so it's not even going to grow mm -hmm. up and and uh and you know pass on the gene drive but um, it's it's unlikely to be that, and and you could you, you could check the design of your guide RNAs and make sure you choose ones that don't have you know a significant off-target effect. Some of the gene drive technology could could be thought. Okay, I, I'm thinking along the lines of COVID right now. So people talk about gain of function research and this sort of thing um, for viruses. Is is this the sort of technology that has bioweapon applications as well uh, is this a of concern is, uh, uh do you mean for being sort of getting it into the human um, exactly. gene pool yeah. do you mean yeah yeah um yeah obviously that's something that's uh, that i've uh, that i've thought about just as a as a, as a thought experiment because it's just fun to think about it um yeah i mean if somebody were to just engineer a human gene or gene drive that would target fertility do you mean uh for example yeah exactly um uh you know so that you might you might engineer it into one person, you know, whether they, uh, whether it's unknowingly or what or not, or whether they volunteer themselves, um, and so that then they then try to, you know, go to a sperm bank and and then sort of, you know, <laughs> um, donate and introduce their their gene drive to as many people as possible. Um, sure, it might um, it might sort of have a bit of an impact for a generation or two until somebody cottoned on that there's a fertility problem running in that particular family they might sequence the genome they might then they'd probably detect that there's a gene drive present then they'd realize that a generation or so 
ago, somebody must have surreptitiously introduced a gene drive into the population. Then very quickly, you just have a PCR test to uh, to be able to see if you've got a gene drive or not. And if a gene drive actually spread enough through the human population, it's not going to wipe out the human po human population because long before you'd get to the point where the population is actually starting to become suppressed, you, there would suddenly be a cultural shift where if you're if you're you know um, wooing a, a partner to raise a family with or whatever, then you would you would have a sort of a, a mutual PC, um, DNA test to check that the 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 other um, member of the <laughs> partnership doesn't have a ha carry a gene drive um and or you know so so ultimately it would never be able to be able to spread through the population unbeknownst to the population because we have dna tests for that sort of thing and so it would create a an odd situation for the long-term future i guess because not everyone would get tested and it would probably keep on you know right sneaking through the population at low levels i guess it's a sort of a it's an interesting um scenario but it, it certainly wouldn't hum doom the human race and i mean a lot of people would argue that well if we can limit um, population growth in humans at least a little bit uh it's not really a disaster it's just it's obviously a bit of a bummer for some families that wanted to have a family and that they didn't get to or, or something like that but that's that's about the only downside so the I point suppose. is that our the time scales don't really work for humans we're not like no, a mosquito. No, and, and, that... and we we haven't really talked about time scales very much, but um, or at all. But um, yeah, clearly the, the huge human generation time, you know, is you know means it would take thousands of years. And ma maybe you know maybe if we we had World War Three and we all went back to sticks and stones, and there was still a gene drive in the population, uh, maybe then it would have an impact because we would lose mm. the capacity to sort of you know to test, detect it. Um, yeah, to detect it, uh, and. Um, but you know, for, for so, but all the all the pest species that I've you know sort of mentioned, I you know they they all have their pros and cons in terms of how fast a gene drive would work and how easy it would be to deploy. So I mean, rabbits are good because they have very short. They're, they're they're one of the best species because they have a very short lifespan. I, I was actually surprised when I when I learned they only actually live for about two years in the wild. A rabbit is a, a typical life cycle, and so you've got a fast generation time. And they fortunately they they breed like rabbits. So, so they produce lots of offspring. So there's you've got that nice exponential growth uh, as well. So so I think a rabbit gene drive would be pretty fast. Uh, it would mm. you know it would have a good impact in a you know in a couple of decades I reckon. And 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 um, but where I say foxes you know more like five years sort of the lifespan and cats feral cats as well. It's another thing with the, the whole domestic cat sort of thing. That's a I could talk for another ten minutes. I'm happy to talk for another <laughs> mm. uh, bit of, about that side of things. But um. But you know, there's been some population modeling where if, if you introduce you know a hundred or so um, animals into the population, and with animals like foxes and cats that have a long generation time, uh, you know it, it take more than a hundred years or so. But but that's assuming that you just have that initial release of a hundred mm -hmm. gene drive individuals that are captively bred. I would argue that that would never be the scenario anyway. As soon as you've decided that you're going to invest in a gene drive, you're going to do a lot more than you're going to have a mm -hmm. huge fox breeding facility where you're just going to you're going to be you just you know, strategically out. uh yeah across the landscape you know you're going to use population modeling to and monitoring to figure out where the best places to to drop the gene drive foxes are and you're going to invest you know um you know hundreds of thousands of dollars millions maybe uh into doing that knowing what the the, the long-term beneficial outcome is so that's why i'm sort of a little bit sort of dismissive of the pessimism of those models that you know those models were produced and they just mm -hmm. plonk them there and there. So, so yeah so it's going to take hundreds of years and and even if it were going to take 100 years um i mean the best time to plant a tree is 50 it's years now. ago uh yeah. yeah or 50 years ago even and like you know if people 50 years ago had the gene drive technology uh the capacity to develop it and they thought ah oh, no it's going to take too too long to develop so we won't bother we would be pretty pissed with off with them right now wouldn't we uh that uh, mm -hmm. that they've just you know that wasted 50 years when, when it should have been done so the sooner the better however long it takes or even the, the longer it takes um the the sooner we, we should, should get be, onto it yeah. Uh, yeah exactly um cane toads you know they they lay 30,000 eggs at a time mm -hmm. uh, which is obviously means that the capacity to grow them up in captivity is is pretty huge you'd want to grow them up to a to a stage in the life cycle where you know they're going to survive in the wild because you know in the wild they lay lay 30,000 eggs at a time but statistically only two of those actually reach or slightly more than two reach um breeding um age which is kind of amazing when you think about it that's out of 30,000 eggs on average about two 
make it. Um, but most of the mortality would be in those uh, early tadpole stages. So in are the eggs toxic? Them up. Um, I don't know about the eggs themselves. I know that the in the early tadpole stages, uh, there there that there is toxin uh, produced. Uh, yeah, this um, I should know this, um, but I know that there's 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 cannibalism in be between the tadpoles as well, mm -hmm. and I think the toxin kind of is a factor as well that comes into it with the um, with the cannibalism. Um, yeah, I forget the details of that, but the yeah, there's something about that. Yeah, because I, I suppose if they were toxic, then maybe you don't expect the same drop in numbers from the egg to the to the uh, adult stage, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, in Australia, if you're growing them up. Yeah. In yeah, if you're so, growing them up in captivity, you mean? Or, yeah. No, no, in, in for the wild uh, animals. Yeah. So yep. maybe fifty thousand eggs are laid, but only two survive and, mm. and turn into adult cane toads. But that's because in their native range, they're being predated upon, presumably uh, in the eggs. Preyed on by 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 fish or, or frog or you know adult frogs or birds or whatever i don't know what 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 would eat cane toad eggs that are whereas in australia a, if they were toxic you'd presumably you wouldn't have the same drop in numbers if the eggs are toxic well um but the eggs are toxic you mean in south australia would, would the, if the eggs are toxic in australia they'd also be toxic in south america but uh, the on. predators in south america oh, because of the predators yeah. oh, i see what you mean um yeah but i think the eggs I think the eggs are not so toxic. I don't think the eggs would be so toxic uh, um, that even Australian predators that aren't resistant would die from it. I think Australian predators only die from eating adult toads. I don't think mm -hmm. there's any evidence of them dying from eating toad eggs. I don't think. Uh, I don't know what creatures would mostly finish off a lot of the tadpoles in, in ponds. Um, yeah. I don't. It, it may be that they they actually managed to metamorphose i actually haven't sort of you know followed this up and up uh to actually figure out at what what stage they'd have to be grown up to in captivity but it may be at the sort of post metamorphosis mm -hmm. frog kind of total stage um i'm not sure about that and, and when once they come on land maybe it's just like you know birds get them and but they're too young to actually have a significant amount of toxin that the right. birds that's a problem for the birds yeah i'm not sure i'm, I'm kind of making that up <laughs> Back to the topic of uh, bioweapons, though, you kind of pointed out something that I had not thought of before, which is that, you know, if we were in a post-apocalyptic scenario where we no longer have testing available, then the, the gene drive would then become a real problem because you can't detect it in the population anymore. But maybe this points out exactly where the applications might be on, on Earth, right? There are poor nations that don't have the capacity to test uh for the presence of say a gene driving the population True. so you could you could imagine a situation mm. where imagine you had a gene drive that uh, meant that every one of your children was going to be male let's say mm. Mm. uh then you could imagine if 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 i have three sons it's not so unusual right mm. and then if they if each one of those families has three sons it's not really that unusual for each yeah, one yeah you wouldn't you wouldn't it, detect it as being abnormal uh just from that but after six generations of only sons, you might think, hang on, something's going on here. Yeah, eventually yeah. you'd see statistically in the population that, hey, uh, significantly less than 50% of the population is female or, or the births this year. Yeah. Is, and then you'd start thinking about this. But at, at that point, if you're a poor country that doesn't have mm -hmm. access to yeah. PCR tests yeah. and this sort of thing. So maybe this is the sort of thing uh, that wealthy yeah. nations, if evil wealthy nations could impose, yeah, yeah, yeah. could, could yeah, spread yeah. across um, the world and yeah, not worrying let's, let's about. Just not, let's, let's just not let Vladimir Putin know uh, <laughs> about this. Uh, <laughs> um, I thought you were actually going to actually maybe even, uh, I just thought of something else. I thought you were leading to that was that, you know, you know how in you know, like in China, China, when they had the one child policy and, you know, and then it ends up being a disproportionate number of baby boys because right. there's obviously, you know, yeah things going on that uh that because the families just decide that it's better to have boys than girls and then that leads to uh you know <laughs> to a um a sex ratio bias you know generations generation down the track um which then you know population-wide obviously causes a problem because you've got this you know um however many millions 20 million extra males in the population um and but but nevertheless even 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 if you know um families knew that that was going on they they would still have that sort of 
cultural impetus to still prefer males because they just have mm-hmm. the you know they just think that it's better to to have males and then if you had a gene drive in the population where we're basically <laughs> assuring male production like you know the, the gene drive family might actually then culturally become um you know a, a benefit naturally preferred uh and mm-hmm. and so and then basically the, the population would be eating itself uh mm. essentially it would be it would have i mean it would get to a point obviously where you, where the culture would change but when you once you've got 90 percent males and 10 percent females then obviously the culture is gonna like oh yeah <laughs> we have yeah, a problem maybe yeah <laughs> we, uh yeah and and it's it wouldn't yeah and it would naturally change you, you wouldn't have to convince anyone that to prefer to have girls people mm. would start naturally you know they'd, they'd get over the, the the ridiculous um prejudice and and then and actually just then start start having girls because yeah it, it would it, it financially think... it, it, it would become um essentially because you know basically you, you like the dowry kind of thing basically mm-hmm. if, if you've got daughters you would you know people would be paying you you know mm-hmm. millions to to have the 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 privilege of your daughter's hand in marriage or something like that <laughs> but at uh, that point anyway, uh interesting yeah. such a large percentage of the popul of the male population would then i'm not going to use the word infected but would would have this uh modification that carry the gene yeah. yep mm. yeah so so you're looking at uh social pressures that sort of run alongside the gene drive and and promote it even further it's uh yeah 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 it's a uh, yeah, feed forward loop uh, essentially uh, isn't it yeah are there safety mechanisms in in place like can you can you reverse a gene drive or can you switch it off or yeah 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 um common question so there are there are some kind of designs for gene drives that are that are sort of you know specifically focused on um on sort of being self limiting so they won't go for too many generations so this is more for situations not so much in Australia's context uh, but where there's, you know, a particular population of a species, you don't want to get rid of it because it's a native species in another country, but it might be a, car- a vector for some disease or something like that, and you want to sort of limit the, the population. So there has been interest in, in developing what are called uh, these daisy chain gene drives that are, that are sort of designed in a way that they'll they'll peter out sort of after a few, there's a sort of an alteration that occurs each generation, and after a set number of generations, like four or five generations, the gene drive will basically just peter out and uh, mm-hmm. and and stop working. Uh, so they can be deliberately designed that way. So that this is something where you might just you, know, you just release a number of gene drives and animals into the population, and it'll just suppress the population for you know a few years, um, and then you just release more animals if you need to later on. So that so that's, these are much more complicated to design. Um, so obviously this is not the kind of design that we want for eradicating pest species in Australia. Um, so. Uh, of course, there is the concern. Um, you know, what if you know, uh, uh, an introduced species in Australia gets back to the country where it originally came from, where it's not regarded uh, as a pest? Um, so there is uh, there is a, a way around that. Um, so basically, um, uh, you, it's 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 actually easier uh, to engineer a resistant allele for that gene drive than it is to engineer the gene drive in the first place. So it's like I said, you know, the gene, the, the resistance can emerge if, if, you know, if you alter that sequence of the of the guide RNA site. Um, and uh, so you can engineer just an altered part of that sequence at that at site, or even for all five of the sites, if you've got five different guide RNAs all targeting that one gene, you can just do a little change in the sequence at each of those positions. Uh, it's it's, a, it's a, a change that won't affect the, the function of the fertility gene. So it will have no impact on the fertility gene, mm-hmm. but it, it will just mean that that's resistant. So, so for example, if you know, let's say, I, I think it's a very unlikely scenario that that somebody would manage to maliciously smuggle, say, a gene drive cane toad back to South America, where gene drives, um, where sorry, where cane toads come from. But you know, you still have to consider that the possibility that you know, in in, pr- in principle, it might it might occur. There might be somebody who would actually go out into the field manage to identify a gene drive toad, do a quick PCR on it. Oh yeah, that's a gene drive toad. And then, you know, it's, 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 and just, to, yeah, it, it, you know, bi- biosecurities, like, I mean, Australia's biosecurity has been pretty good. Like it was terrible, obviously, in the early days of European settlement, we bring so many things. But actually, if you look, you look back in the past, you know, 50 or so, even longer uh, number of years, the number of species that have actually got into Australia and established feral populations is sort of very small, and so our biosecurity is generally pretty good. And I think it's you know, it you know going the other way um, should be um, you know should be pretty good news. But anyway, 
as I said, uh, you still have to consider that it might in principle be possible. And so you could um, you could engineer that resistant uh, gene drive resistant allele in a in a population of cane toads that you might just keep in a laboratory or you might, you know, keep the some embryos cryopreserved or you might have a little island where you just maintain a, a, a population as a as a um, kind of a, as a reserve uh, population. Just in case, you know, at some point down the track, um, somebody releases a gene drive into South America and it starts to impact the population, will you just release the resistant mm. ones? And those resist resistant ones would actually then outcompete the gene drive. The gene drive would actually then go extinct uh, mm -hmm. in that context. Uh, and that's been sort of modeled, uh, you know, the population modeling of that. So, yeah, so it, it's, it's, um, it's possible to predict against that. This might be a silly question, but how many uh bases can you flip in an animal and it still remain sort of viable you know I, i'm guessing that's what you're talking about right you're, you're doing these little flips at locations where the crispr would be targeting uh and... do you mean the the copying of the gene drive do you mean or do you so mean you just getting strength... the gene drive into the animal in the first place so, so what i mean is the following you you have uh mm. your gene drive which functions you, you have a strand of mm. rna which mm -hmm. matches up to some strand of dna in the this, this is the guide animal. rna that tells yeah, exactly that tells the crispr where to cut yep yeah and and so yep. from what i understand you can design an animal which has slight variations such that the the guide rna just simply doesn't match up anymore yeah to produce a resistant animal you mean yeah exactly yep. and so my question is very simply how many of these flips can i make before an animal in general is non-viable is uh uh a limitless number um basically because so it so in um yeah i mean i mean you you, pr you probably wouldn't do them all at the same time so because because it's kind of a little bit efficient to sort of do these edits to sort of change a little bit to the the methods for these this is actually um uh, progressing quite well these sort of systems called prime editing where you can sort of edit the um you know just do small little sequence edits it's where you're just changing a few bases without actually creating a DNA cut. So they're actually, mm -hmm. um, you know, these sophisticated methods that, that, that where you can sort of, um, you know, introduce the, these uh, prime editing um, um, modified versions of CRISPR uh, that'll sort of, you know, alter a few um, uh, bases in the, in the sequence. And, um, and uh, yeah, and, and you, potentially you could do that simultaneously. It just comes down to the efficiency, whether you, how many edits you can do at once be, before you then sort of, you know, if you're doing it in cell lines, you just keep growing the cells and you and you isolate the ones that have got the successful edits, and then you do the next edits and then the next edits and the next edits. Uh it's it's just a it's just a numbers game in terms of efficiency, but it doesn't affect the viability of the mm -hmm. cells really. Um, you know, the cells cells are sort of naturally repairing sort of, you know, breaks, you know, you know sort of errors in their DNA all the time. Uh and so it's yeah, I think you'd have to be doing an awful lot before you would be hitting the limits of the Sort of meta making metabolic demands or something like that on the cell of of managing all of these edits at the same time here in germany where i am there's a lot of anti-gmo sentiment right in, in the population so i'm wondering do you do you ever have people who accuse you of playing god or do you have people who are sort of attacking the research do you find this or it's pretty safe in uh yeah yeah i mean the, so far, not not so much. I mean, people often that they use the phrase "playing God." Uh, <laughs> I'm being an atheist, of course. I have to sort of like rephrase that in my head, uh, and uh, and my, my usual response is uh, is uh, then, um, well, you know, um, uh, humans played devil. Uh, you know, since Europeans arrived uh, in Australia, uh, they played the devil for for quite a long time uh, and uh, caused an awful lot of damage. So maybe it's about time we actually started playing God to actually reverse some of that damage that was done um so i mean that's just yeah <laughs> comes down to sort of rhetoric and uh, a little bit and how you describe that um but in terms of uh yeah gmos uh i mean a, a lot of the, you know it was more the gmo food uh sort of you know uh that people were sort of most concerned about um i guess over the over the past uh, few decades but there's been a big turnaround in that i think you know uh now there's sort of there seems to be a lot more acceptance of of gmo foods and people have sort of started to realize that there's nothing inherently dangerous about eating modified dna uh you know modified dna is just dna we're eating dna all the time and and it's really you know that just the modification of the dna itself is not a risk uh 
it's you know yeah it needs to be a case by case situation like obviously if you're having a gmo food you assess well what is this modification what plausible effect could it have on one's health not the dna modification itself but whatever the the you know the result of that modification is in what it's you know, doing to the cell if it's producing a, a new protein or whatever what's the impact of that that's a very easy thing to assess to to actually figure out if it's plausible that it is a risk or not very easy to do sort of risk assessments of that and i think people are just sort of starting to understand that and they're starting to realize that you know the, the sky doesn't fall in when you when you eat modified dna and i think that i think with um, gm wildlife I mean, a lot of people haven't even considered the you know the the concept of gm wildlife uh you know having the thought because it just haven't been examples of it really so they haven't bothered to sort of think about it um but i think that will probably go through um the same kind of transition i think there will, pe will there will be people who who get alarmed by it um but then i think it will just require small wins um in in contexts that people don't really care about like eradicating a, a rodent population on an offshore island where all the rodents are eating all the seabird eggs mm -hmm. and there are, no humans are on that island and um and basically and then there's a success story where it wipes out all the rodents um so with paul thomas's work i, th I think that will achieve that outcome um before too long uh, i think that will be the first success story um mm -hmm. with with his rodent work and, and it'll be a fantastic eco ecologically ecological outcome uh for that for that island and people will cheer and nobody will think that was awful because there'll be no evidence of it having been awful all the mice will die out the seabirds will be happy and yeah end of story and i think as there are more of those examples in the media people will realize that the sky doesn't fall in and just get used to the idea that you know this this sort of technology can be can be used um for you know amazingly beneficial outcomes hmm. in some sense then there's a lot of weight on your shoulders right because you need to make sure that the first release really goes smoothly and that nothing goes mm -hmm. wrong I, I don't know if it was mixed mitosis or one of the other um uh it's Khaleesi virus is the one that was yeah, yeah that, that that sort of basically the timing yeah we, I, I think it, it it was basically um re, there was a mistiming in its release uh it was an accident or an accidental release or whatever and it wasn't optimal for for the the what the time of year when the breeding season of the rabbits were so it didn't have the impact that it could have had and it was perhaps a bit embarrassing or whatever um so yeah i mean but it just it lessened the impact that it could have had a, uh, initially but you know there was always going to be a bounce back in the rabbit population from Khaleesi virus anyway um as occurred with myxomatosis and i think with um with these sort of successive um uh, biocontrols that have been used on rabbits every time uh these new diseases are introduced that are just diseases from elsewhere in the world and natural rabbit populations the, the the you know the population rabbit populations up here initially and then it crashes because of the new disease and it recovers but it doesn't get up to the same level that it was uh initially mm -hmm. and then and then another new disease Khaleesi virus this time is introduced and then it recovers so each time the rabbit population is recovered it hasn't got back to the kind of population levels that it used to be um you know during um the early, early European or the not, uh, 19th century um so but you know it's still they, they bounce back and they're still still a big problem why um, is that is that because yeah. uh, immunity isn't complete and it just uh it's 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 g genetic resistance uh basically emerges so it would it presumably I I don't know anything about the actual mechanism of the genetic resistance but it, presumably it's going to be something like um genetic variations in the in the receptor the protein receptors on the cells that the viruses bind to i'm making this up it might be something like that so you know how like the the um, covid uh, the coronavirus mm -hmm. binds to those two receptor and you know so so if you have some mutations in the rabbits where the basically that receptor that's used for something else in the cell um if there's a modification that doesn't affect significantly its normal function for whatever it does in the cell but it's enough to sort of you know inhibit the binding then that's by and that and that's just sort of natural natural variation of population when you've got a huge population you're going to have you know mutations uh that that uh, or natural variation in in something like that receptor and then there's a very very strong natural selection pressure obviously on that um in the context of the disease and eventually you know all the whole rabbit population has that resistance but is the argument that those rabbits that have resistance are less viable for other reasons so, so they might be they might be very slightly less viable like if you put those rabbits um back into say europe with you know where they where they came from originally and then they're competing against uh european rabbits actually no european rabbits would have been exposed to all of these diseases as well uh 
so they would have some of that resistance as well so it's it's possible that the sort of natural variation in the in the in australia in fact it's it's possible that sort of the ancestral version of i'm speculating here completely but it's, it's possible the ancestral version of that receptor um already you know was was the resistant one in europe and then when they were introduced to australia because they were in the context of no disease there was actually a selection for a sort of a slightly better version of that receptor that functioned a bit better in the absence of the disease and then you know the whole population then had that version and then you introduce the disease back in again and then suddenly that that version um you know that allele of, of the gene that produces, produces that receptor has suddenly has a disadvantage so again i'm speculating but that, that's that's kind of the sort of you know chasing kind of effect that you know evolution ha has in this sort of arms race that's going on mm. between diseases and hosts and um and and, and, and disease vectors yeah I'm, I'm just interested that I find it interesting that the level yeah. never sort of recovers to pre calesian pre myxomatosis. Right. Yeah, because there is a low level. Well, the, the disease is still present. That's what I should say. Sorry. Yeah, the reason it doesn't go back to that level. Sorry, I think I slightly misunderstood your question before. Uh, the reason it doesn't go back to that level is that we there is still a low level of myxomatosis and calesi virus going through the population uh, and still still having an impact on the health of the uh, individuals. So they're not you know as robust and you know um reproducing as, as vigorously as they were before the disease was introduced so i mean there's still myxomatosis around if anyone who has a pet rabbit um you know um, has to be careful that or you know, it can happen mm -hmm. that people's pet rabbit can get myxo still because the, it is still in the environment but so under australian law are you allowed to release animals uh, into the, uh, genetically modified animals how does that story um go? yeah yeah so that that, that the actual um yeah i'm not going to be producing gene drive animals in the lab and then just releasing them yeah. willy-nilly of course there's a there's a very very tight regulative process that would would have to be um you know this would have to go through there'd be multiple levels of uh, you know a testing and approval and permits and everything there'd, there'd have to be a you know the social license the public acceptance of before you know um all of these things are sort of regulated so it would it would, it would be a long um process to go through all that which is kind of what, why the conversation needs to start uh, as soon as possible people have to sort of start thinking about it um the, the the legal framework for it has to start being developed rather than you know or once the sort of once the reality is there that we've got gene drive animals in the lab um which are all very you know, you know under tight sort of you know laboratory sort of security uh conditions of course um you know so that's the sort of um the, the requirements for being able to do this sort of research is that you have to have all those um mechanisms biosecurity mechanisms in place um Yes, and if, that if uh, it, the, the sooner we have these, you know, the, the the law starts to catch up, um, and so that it's ready by the time we get to the point of having gene drive animals, the better. Mm. Um, yeah. So and and so that's that's why I mean I've sort of been you know involved myself in a few sort of um, sort of events and things like that to to sort of actually you know provide more education to the to the public and to you know conservation sort of agencies and to government agencies and um you know and farmers and all all the sort of stakeholders um and uh including um uh animal welfare agencies like the rspca for example um because one thing about gene drive is it's it's an amazingly humane uh method of pest control because it's you know you stopping, stopping the animals from breeding you basically can potentially wipe out an entire population without killing a single animal uh and that's you know compared with the you know current methods of baiting and um you know shooting and, and trapping and all these sort of other methods that have their their problems um uh you know then organizations like the rsp pca or to be all over gene drive uh and and yeah and we've had quite positive sort of responses back from you know people we've contacted uh in rspca uh earlier on you gave a sort of a, an overview a little bit of how you use crispr to design gene drives but could you give sort of more of an overview of, of how you would actually go about in practice in the lab so in in day-to-day -day work when you're sitting down and you're pipetting and you're actually yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, what does that picture look like in practice so 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 with with the research that we're doing there, there are kind of two applications to crispr itself one of them is um the, the the having the crispr gene the gene that actually produces the cas9 it's called cas9 enzyme is basically the, the enzyme that that um um performs crispr if you like um so um 
so you know we have to produce constructs that 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 are you know our prototype kind of gene drive designs that include a Cas9 gene within that design. Uh, but then we're also using CRISPR as a tool to get those fragments of DNA uh, that contain the gene drive into inserted into the in, into the genome of whether it's cells or uh, cultured cells or or a zygote or, or whatever uh, an embryo. Um, so. So in terms of the latter, in terms of just using it as a tool to insert a fragment uh, into the genome of a cell, you can. Uh, there are a couple of ways you can you can um, sort of you know uh, use or acquire CRISPR. One is you can just simply buy it as a protein from a biotech company. There are lots of biotech companies that sell uh, that sell Cas9 as an enzyme, and you just buy it in a little tube, a little bit of liquid at the bottom that contains um, your Cas9 enzyme, and you just include that in your in your mix and your little. Um, fine injection needle that you're injecting into the zygote, and, uh, and that'll have a, a cocktail of different things, including your your Cas9 enzyme. Um, or you can include it as a um, instead of the actual enzyme, the protein enzyme itself. You can include it as a as a DNA molecule that um, it's called a plasmid, a circular um, DNA molecule called a plasmid, um, which which can t contain the Cas9 gene. Uh, and when you inject that that circular plasmid into uh, into the cell or into the embryo, uh, then um, the Cas9 will uh, will be the gene will sort of basically be expressed uh, within the cell and produce the uh, the enzyme in the same way that any gene uh, in the in the uh, in an animal's genome uh, is expressed and produces a protein that basically you know corresponds to that gene. So every gene sort of you know, produces a particular kind of protein. So and then that's a way of introducing the you know indirectly introducing the Cas9 enzyme into your cells as well, so that it can do its job for the for the gene editing thing that you that you're trying to do in the lab. Um, yeah. So, but so, so the picture that. I have, yeah, yeah. if I if I understand correctly, is mm -hmm. that you you have a um, you have a strain of RNA which tells you tells the Cas9 where to do the cut. Uh, in, yep. a, in a strand of DNA. This is the guide RNA. Yep, yep. Yep, this is a guide RNA. And then there are natural processes in the in cells which repair snipped DNA and put it back together. And so you you also have a, you have some, so there are two sort of questions I have. You, you have a template which tells it how to do the repair, I suppose. And the, 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 the two things- Well, the template really... just tells it where to where to cut, really. The, the, that, 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 Oh, sorry, the the guide RNA tells it where to cut, and mm. the, the and the template yeah provides. How to repair? Hang on, are you talking about the the copying of the gene drive, or are you talking about producing well, so the, getting a gene drive into a cell in the first place? So there are two the the two key questions I have, and that I'm sort of confused by, and that I'd like to understand better are the following. First of all, so I understand that you can have some guide RNA which matches up to a segment of of uh, some DNA mm -hmm. sequence of the, genome. Yep. of the genome, but I don't understand how you construct that RNA sequence to begin with. The, so I don't All understand. Right. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. This is where the biotech tech companies come in handy again. So there, there are lots of biotech companies that just commercially will synthesize um, a strand of this uh, guide RNA to whatever specific sequence you ask them to design. So basically, if I want to, um, like it's a, they're about twenty bases long, a, a guide RNA. Um, and, um, and basically I, I just, I go to the, the web form, uh, for that particular biotech company and I enter my sequence that I want, um, in, into the form and, uh, and I, um, pay for it. And, uh, and then I get a little tube a week or so later that, uh, that has, um, like the dried up sort of, um, pellet of, uh, lyophilized, um, RNA in it, which is basically represents, a you know, a, a dose of that, of that guide RNA of that sp specific sequence that I specified. So they have machines that can basically synthesize um, um, DNA or RNA uh, to in, any particular sort of specified sequence of, of lengths ranging from very short, you know, 20 nucleotide RNA to strands of DNA. Uh, so DNA is much easier to synthesize than RNA, um, but you can you, they can synthesize strands of DNA that are thousands of, of base pairs long, basically. Um, it's much more difficult, more expensive, yeah. I didn't realize. So we can literally print out base by base short strands of RNA, and that's how essentially, it's done. yeah, 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 yeah. It's because it's it basically synthesizes it by it. It sort of does it a base at a time. So it basically it it it, it does it by 
I, I'm not fully on top of all the, all the chemistry of how it works, but basically you'll, you know, if it's if it's A, T, G, G, after it's added the T, then it will sort of the, alter the chemical composition of, of that sort of reaction that's going on so that the next nucleotide that has to be added has got to be a G. Mm -hmm. And then you add something else that means that the next nucleotide that's got to be added has to be a T. It's, there's, you know, it's, it's not my field. It's uh, the realm of, uh, of um, biochemists, but um, but it's a very well established uh, technique. That's that's. I mean, it's a huge industry. Basically, it's it it what's it's what drives so much, um, you know, cell biology, molecular biology um, research, and you know, therapeutic medicine as well. Uh, you know, there's so much of the world's um, uh, research sort of depends on these sort of uh, the the capacity of these biotech companies to produce these made to order sequences. This might be a silly question but where how do you know where to where where a gene starts you know, you have this strand of dna and you want to mm -hmm. insert at some point how do you know that you're not snipping halfway mm -hmm. you know in in the middle of a yeah. DNA gene oh uh, yeah so there's there's ways of sort of recognizing where genes uh start and finish there are particular sort of sequence motifs little sort of like for example the end of a gene where the the, the part that basically remain so so a gene sort of the 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 important part of a gene uh, that encodes the protein, um, you know, can be defined by a sort of recognizable start and stop. So, for example, the the, the start of the gene that that basically encodes the start of that protein is always an ATG, for example, mm -hmm. that that encodes mm -hmm. a methionine amino acid, which is always the start of a protein. And the the uh, end of um, the gene uh, will always be signaled by one of three different um, what are called codons, these little triplets of nucleotides. So it's three three bases will represent will code for one amino acid and so uh at, so at the end of it, it's always a taa um or a or a, um, a tag or a tga are the three uh, codons that um, um signal the end of a gene so you can recognize it. and there's a lot of sort of bioinformatics sort of predictive software that can be used to sort of figure out you know in in the sort of huge expanse of the genome which or, or, you know of which only a small percentage of it you know one percent actually encodes proteins uh there's software that's that's been developed over you know over decades that is able to sort of recognize and there are ways of sort of you, you can actually take the the mrna so when when a, a gene encodes for a protein it's actually first copied into an rna molecule first and then that rna molecule then is used as a, as a template for then producing the protein so you can actually figure out um where all the genes are by actually just isolating all of the all of that RNA or mRNA we've heard of mRNA from the mRNA vaccines uh that mRNA um uh you could just like extract all of the mRNA from the cells purify it and then sequence it figure out what the sequence of all those mRNA molecules are and then once you know the sequences of all those mRNA molecules that you know represent all the essentially genes that produce proteins you just map those back to the genome and figure out where they match up in the genome and you say oh that's a that mRNA is identical to that bit of sequence in the genome so that's where there's a gene and so you can sort of recognize it bioinformatically that way. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. So, so I sort of understand now how you develop the, the guide RNA. And so, so it goes in and tells Cas9 where to snip the, the, the DNA. And, and so the, my second question is, okay, so then the body, body has some natural repair mechanism that stitches things back together. And, but you want to provide a template somehow that, that says, okay, when you're doing the stitching, I want you to in insert this bit of DNA. So, so how does right, that yeah, function? Yeah, so this is when we're getting the gene drive in in the first place rather yeah. than the copying of the gene drive, yes. Um, so that's that's a very inefficient process, which is why we sort of need to do it in cell lines uh, rather than just doing it in, in, in embryos mm -hmm. so that we can you know, select for the cells that have it. Um, and there are, there are sort of, yeah, there are lots of kind of tricks that you can use to sort of try to improve the efficiency of it. Um, you know, there are sort of various sort of um, drugs that you can use to sort of inhibit the pathway that just causes the, the stitching together without using a template and other sort of drugs that help to promote using that template um, to to repair the cut. Um, and another way, and then you've got to try and identify the cells. So this is a, also an important part of the trick. You've got to identify the cells that have actually successfully got it in um, because you need to isolate those cells. And so a common way of doing that, for example, would be um, to use some sort of a um, have some sort of a reporter gene that produces a fluorescent protein, for example. Mm -hmm. And so, so this this fragment you're trying to knock in, uh, you just you, you'll it'll it'll include a gene that produces a green fluorescent protein um, called GFP. Uh, it's a very widely used sort of 
tool in, in molecular biology, cell biology. Uh, and, uh, and then, so then after you've done your, your, um, your experiment where you've transfected the, the cells with the, you know, all your CRISPR reagents, then you'll, um, take, take your cells to a mark the next day, you'll take your cells to a microscope, uh, and check them under, um, and uh, UV light and and look for that green fluorescence and you say, ah, oh, that cell is glowing green. So I know it successfully inserted uh, that that fragment of DNA. Um, so yeah, there are various tricks like that that you can use to sort of get get that happening. So if I understand correctly, along with uh, CRISPR-Cas9, you inject little fragments of D DNA which get uh, yeah. So you'll have a cocktail. It, yeah, if you're doing it into a, into a zygote, for example. Um, you'll have a cocktail of different things. So you'll have your Cas9 enzyme. You'll have um, the guide RNA that's going to cut, you know, we, we, the, the genome in the correct location and say in the fertility gene, for example. And uh, and then you'll have um, uh, a synthetic piece of um, DNA that has that template that also has a little bit extra at each end uh, that matches either side of that cut side so that the so that cell mechanism can use that template to so you'll really recognize those bits that sort of match either side of the cut cut site so it'll successfully use that as a template and again that that long piece of dna that might be sort of you know many thousands of bases long uh that's something you can you can have synthesized by a biotech company to the exact mm. sequence that you want and you can use you know you can use the published genome for that species um because we you know a lot of these species we and not all of them but we're trying to se sequence the genomes of more species to help with this work um you'll you'll have the you know the genome that you have um uh, on your computer and you can you can um, basically use that sequence that you that you've got to sort of submit it to the biotech company to say send me a, a piece of dna that has that piece of sequence that yeah. particular sequence and the inefficiency is just that because you've injected this cocktail sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't yeah the the inefficiency it doesn't work as efficiently as as the gene drive copying mechanism because that occurs uh, the gene drive copying me mechanism occurs in the germ cells and the sperm and the eggs. And the, fortunately, fortunately, in sperm and eggs, there's a natural mechanism for bringing those sort of like those sister chromosomes together. You know, you've got the two copies of each, um, you know, of our chromosomes. And during um, uh, egg and sperm development, germ cell development, there's a there's a natural step in the you know if people people who know sort of their high school um, biology might remember the process of meiosis, which is basically the the steps where 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 the, the the dna is sort of copied and then it's sort of and then it's aligned um the chromosomes align next to each other and those homologous chromosomes the sister chromosomes align next to each other and there's like these crossovers that occur between them so there's basically an exchange uh of genetic material between those two um chromosomes um that that have basically come together because they have very very similar sequences almost identical sequences with a few differences and that's what creates that genetic diversity uh you know in 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 our population or, or is a large reason why it's it's basically like shuffling the deck of of our sort of you know uh if you think of our genome as a as a deck of cards and we, you, you shuffle the deck to get a new sort of order of all of our genes or a new combination of the the alternative alleles of each of our genes that that basically creates the genetic diversity that we have uh in in populations and so, so that's a you know a specific method uh, mechanism in those germ cells that brings those two um, uh, similar sequences together, which is why it's very easy for the that cut strand of DNA to find that matching partner template because it's already sitting right there, you know, very close uh, within uh, the cell. Um, in the case of um, uh, cells that you're just growing in a dish, like adult somatic cells or whatever, growing in a dish. They don't, they don't, they're not going through that process of meiosis that I haven't brought those sister, you know, homologous chromosomes together. All the chromosomes are just like wherever. And so it's just a matter of chance if you've sort of included that DNA template that you want to use to repair that cup because you want to get it in to, to your cell. It's just a matter of chance whether that a strand of that DNA is floating past at the right time mm -hmm. when that cut has happened and the mechanism can, can use it. So that's why it's a very inefficient process compared with what happens in the germ cells. When you say that you you have these uh, companies that you can contact and they will generate little strands of DNA or an RNA for you, how far away do you think this is from the hands of hobbyists? Do, do you think we're we're getting to a point in the next years where people will be able to in-house uh, 
mm. be able to play with this. I mean, because it. I think people can already, really. I mean, if 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 you know, I, I, I yeah, yeah, probably anyone can, but the, but the, the expertise to actually sort of figure out what you can do with it and actually mm-hmm. do something, you know, um, constructive or whatever with it is that you know there are just so many steps and so many expertises and everything that's required that that um you know it's just it's just not something that's kind of really accessible to to anyone who's not kind of in a um you know you know a big sort of university lab or or whatever or biotech lab um mm-hmm. so yeah i mean i've i don't uh, uh, yeah, i'm not really sure at what point it, it's 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 an interesting question as to to what point these sort of tools like I mean I have seen documentaries where you know they, they, you have these home hobbyists that that sort of you know growing up plasma DNA in bacteria and they they're even producing GFP kind of um, uh, and so forth and and this is a drug or really something or... A, no 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 so GFP is the green fluorescent protein for example okay. I mean I, I've heard, I've heard of people sort of getting a plasma that has the has the GFP drink green fluorescent protein gene in it uh, and so bacteria you uh, sorry plasmids you can you can grow up in bacteria you use basically use bacteria as a, as a factory for mm-hmm. for producing um lots of um these sort of copies of these plasmid uh, molecules and and then you can you, you know you could inject that that plasmid into inject into your body into cells it's not really going to do a lot uh it, it some of it might enter some of your cells and it might sort of make some of your cells grow glow green if you had the right equipment to sort of really sort of see it but at a microscopic level but um I, I, it's it's not something that's that I can see obviously is in danger of becoming a, a a sort of a some sort of a you know global problem or anything like that because I think just the it the yeah it's 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 just too difficult to really mm. use it in a in some sort of mm, scary way that you know it's just it requires too much too many years of expertise and mm-hmm. and equipment and facilities and everything. Um, to do it, I think. Although it is much simpler to use, I've heard, than traditional gene editing techniques, right? The 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 barrier to entry is much lower. Yeah. Right. Yeah. True. Um, I mean, traditional gene editing techniques. Uh, I mean, there's the you know, as I said, like earlier, the 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 transgene where random integration. Yes, you can do that, um, but still, even getting it into cells is 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 very mm. difficult. I mean, if you're you know, if you're talking about doing it to your body, for example, it's kind of hard to really sort of um, get it into cells um, or if you're doing it in cultured cells then you, you've got to you're going to have the facilities to sort of culture cells in a sterile way and everything mm-hmm. uh, and then there are various reagents that you can use or tools that you can use to to get the plasma if you just like tip um, tip plasmid into the you know the culture medium that your cells are growing in they're not just going to spontaneously enter the cells and then to actually get them to, to integrate into the genome requires certain other other kind of strategies and techniques um to do that and that's just for random integration so i wouldn't say you know all of that um yeah well yeah obviously that's that's more difficult the only the only difference with crispr it really is that it's it's the targeting to a particular part of the genome mm-hmm. so that's the advantage crispr doesn't edit genomes if you're just talking about genome editing whether it's random or targeted it doesn't improve your efficiency of genome editing overall it just mm-hmm. improves the efficiency of targeted genome editing because mm-hmm. that was really bad before. That was that was really sort of you know inefficient and hit and miss. Um, so it hasn't changed the efficiency of random integration, which has always been much more efficient than um, targeted integration. It, the image I had in my head, and I, I was sort mm-hmm. of curious to find out, was uh, <laughs> I, I imagined that it, it, at some point it's going to be possible for cartels to use algae to produce whatever drugs they want or you, you know you could produce a genetically modified animal that just produces yes. whatever chemical it is yeah, you're interested yeah. in the, yeah yeah i don't the well um genes can i gene editing can really only be used to introduce some um, genes that produce proteins so mm. i mean not a lot of drugs are actually proteins so um yeah producing producing drugs is kind of a, a, a kind of a different kettle of fish so you'd have to have a you know, if you're trying to sort of introduce a particular enzymatic pathway, uh, you know, with the enzymes of proteins and you, you're trying to establish a gene- an enzymatic pathway in an alga to produce a particular drug, 
that's something that would require a lot of research to actually, you know, and tech, you know, technical expertise to to be able to figure out how to do that. So again, it's not something, you know, there's some some drugs like EPO, for example, that's protein drug, you know, used by athletes. Um, you know, maybe maybe some of those kind of ones could be, but I, I think that's already sort of grown in um, or produced probably in illicit kind of, um, you know, factories anyway. I've, I've got no idea about that uh, that shady world. But <laughs> but I don't think it's an easy, I don't think it's something, you know, proteins are not really something that are, that are going to be too much. Oh, there's growth hormone as well. That's a protein. Uh, mostly it's these, yeah, these, I guess these sort of sports kind of um, proteins, I guess, maybe are sort of the ones that are, um, that, the access to those might increase um perhaps through all of this but not in a not in a world-changing way that i can think mm. of uh, so there are easier pathways to synthesis yeah or it's just it, or it's not the main challenge the main challenge would be just the producing i mean you could probably get hold of cells that produce epo through sort of sinister means um, maybe and then it's once you've got hold of those cells then it's then the expense is more just producing large amounts of them um that's the main sort of expense with it all mm. um yeah I, I don't know it's it's sort of out of, out of my realm i guess <laughs> see yeah. the image i was having was that if you look at for example cocaine or, or some of these drugs which really are produced very heavily in very select areas of the world that have you know the weather has to be a, a certain type of weather and the and, and so on and i was imagining that you could alter an animal or alter a, a, a mm. fungus or a, or a, some organism which then yeah. produces what you want uh in a True. more convenient I mean, fashion mm, i mean I, I, this is probably more more the plant and, and microorganism world than than animals really um i guess where um i mean i guess I was thinking algae large amounts of a protein. Or... Yeah, yeah, algae. Um, yeah, I, I guess. I mean, there, there's, you know, there's that uh, golden rice, you know, that sort of produces, mm -hmm. um, what does it produce, high levels of or something that, um, yeah, which is basically, yeah, so small, you know, introducing transgenes to produce some some useful protein that can be sort of mass produced in, you know, it's sort of by incubators of, of algae. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there are lots of potentially very, very useful applications to the world for with that sort of technology. Um, and it will probably, I think the the use of that technology for good will probably uh, outweigh the the amount that it gets used for evil. But I'm not saying that it's not going to be used for evil hmm. as well, but I just don't know how much. Yeah. But, but um, so, okay. So for, with the gene drive, as far as I understand, and correct me if I'm wrong here, you also you use CRISPR Cas9 to reprogram a, a, a piece of DNA such that it also produces CRISPR Cas9 itself. Is is this the idea? So that it can do cuts. Yeah. To... So there'll be a second copy of the gene drive. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you've got if you've basically managed to produce an animal that's got one copy of the gene drive, mm -hmm. uh, and then and then essentially when you breed from that animal, then when it, in its germ cells, it'll um, all its germ cells will have then, um, two copies of the gene drive. Uh, and so all of the offspring will then inherit uh, the gene drive. So all of the offspring then, because then from the mother, uh, you know, that that male has mated with, she has just, you know, um, normal versions of that fertility gene. So then all of the offspring will then have one normal version from the mother, mother and one uh, gene drive copy from the father. So that'll be what we call heterozygous. They'll have one of each. Um, and then... And then some of those will be males and some of those will be females. They'll still be fertile because they only have one copy. So with the fertility mm -hmm. gene, you'd have to have two copies of the of the knocked out gene drive version of the fertility gene um, for it to actually be infertile. Um, but then, but you basically, you know, it doesn't matter that it's not infertile at that stage, at that generation. They'll then go on to breed with other animals and heterozygous animals will breed with other heterozygous animals. And then a lot of those out animals will be what we call homozygous for the gene drive so they'll have two copies of the gene drive and they and the females of those will be infertile so it doesn't matter at what's at what stage it doesn't matter that that it requires two copies of the gene drive to be infertile the important thing is that the gene drive is increasing in its frequency in the population that it's increasing exponentially exponentially at the expense of the wild type 
um, but, but so of the, of the fertility I, gene. So I can understand. So you, you take an infected animal and a non-infected animal, they have mm -hmm. offspring and mm -hmm. the, the offspring will have one wild type and one um, yep. gene drive type. And then yep. is the, is the idea that the, the gene drive edited type will then infect the non the, the wild type so that then the animal has two uh or so the gene so the so so then so the offspring will have yeah okay one copy of the gene drive and one copy of the wild type um version of the gene and let's say that's a male uh it'll mm -hmm. and it'll be viable it'll it'll just simply mate with um, so I don't use the word infect because it's not really this is just this is just inheritance basically not yeah. not infection uh so that that um that that male will then just find another female it might be just a, a normal female that's just got two normal versions of the fertility gene gene mm -hmm. and mate with her and then all of those offspring will inherit the gene drive because in that male's germ cells that that um, gene drive will have killed off the that um wild type version of the gene uh, uh, just in, in, the, in, in, mm. in, in his sperm yeah in his sperm yeah. um and I so see. then all of the offspring will then inherit that so so yeah if you, if you want to call it infection it's 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 that though that copying is occurring only in the sperm cells so that all of the sperm have mm -hmm. a gene drive rather than only half of them i see i see i see and that's why you get the exponent okay that makes sense mm, yeah. yeah so you get the exponential growth yeah and, and so these haven't been released yet. That it'll be the first time when uh, I forget the name of the research. Oh uh, yeah, so Paul Thomas in Adelaide. Yeah, yeah. So so yeah. The so again, his is not a CRISPR-based uh, uh, gene drive, but um, but uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know how many years off. There'll be there'll be there'll be field trials. Uh, you know, to sort of determine how effective they'll you know they'll identify uh, an island that would be a good candidate to to do a um, to do a release of. Um, somewhere um i don't know how off how long off that would be but um you know i could take a guess and say that they they might be doing a release on an island in two or three years time mm -hmm. i could be i could be wrong maybe it's five or six years time but i, I would have thought i would hope that all of the you know the permits and approvals and things would would get moving in the sort of you know proof of principle in um is sort of um you know demonstrated um that that they might you know be able to do it in two or three years time with enough funding of course in addition to eradicating populations you're also interested in helping uh populations mm. defend against invasive species right so that you're looking at uh, developing immunity to cane toad toxins for example is this following a similar sort of uh techniques or no no this is it's not using a gene drive so a lot, yeah a lot of people suggest uh yeah sort of why not um you know make the resistance gene sort of spread through with the with a uh through the population with a gene drive i would never want to use a gene drive for this sort of thing because it's much better to rely on natural selection uh to you know because if there's if there's anything that that goes wrong you don't want a gene drive to be, you know, to be spreading this uh, <laughs> this this trait through the population. It's it's too risky when you can simply rely on natural selection. So so the example that you that you're referring to is um, the idea of um, uh, sort of protecting the northern quoll, which is a um, a marsupial, carnivorous marsupial about the size of a a ferret. Uh, um, so it lives in in the tropics of uh, northern Australia. And its population is has um, become decimated by the spread of the cane toad across northern Australia. So cane toads are toxic; uh, they contain a, a toxin called bufotoxin. And when the toads try to, uh, sorry, when the quolls try to prey on the toads um, and, and and eat them, uh, they um, they die because uh, of the because of the toxin. So where cane toads originally come from, which is South America and Central America, uh, the natural predators of toads that have co-evolved with them for millions of years they have a natural genetic resistance and it's known what the basis of that genetic resistance is so there's a particular gene which is like a uh, a cell membrane uh, a, a sort of produces a protein that sort of sits in the cell membrane of cells uh, it's important for sort of the um, shuttling of ions across the um, sodium and potassium ions across the cell membrane and there's a um, so all, all, all species have this particular um, in, um, um, protein and and the gene that produces the protein but there's a sort of a slightly modified version uh in the resistant species in south america so it's just a a, a few bases that are different that just change a, a few a couple of amino acids 
um, in that protein. And that's enough to confer resistance to the bufotoxin, the natural resistance that those um, species have. So the idea with the, with the northern quoll is just simply take that same gene uh, that it, it occurs in the northern quoll genome and just do that little tweak of a couple of um, uh, DNA bases that will that will basically change those amino acids that that, that gene encodes uh, the, uh, that, of the protein that that gene encodes. And in principle, that should confer resistance. It may not be um, absolute resistance. It may not be to the same level of resistance that natural predators in South America have, because there are probably other genes that sort of contribute a degree of resistance as well. But so long as uh, there's enough resistance that the animal doesn't drop dead the first time it eats can toad. Uh, and then if it, you know, if it has a, an awful time, but it survives, it won't eat a can toad again, and then it will sort of, it'll just hunt for other things and, and survive. Uh, and then it will pass on that resistance gene mm -hmm. because it survived. It'll have a competitive advantage to the animals that don't have it. So that that resistance gene will um, naturally spread through the population. Now, this is something that you know, give 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 um, the northern quoll thousands of years of coexisting with cane toads, they would eventually evolve that same gene because it's not a big mm -hmm. modification. You know? uh, and but they simply don't have that time because they might all die out well before then. So you're basically giving them a bit of a leg up in evolution by saying, well, you're going to you're going to evolve this anyway. Here it is. Uh, we'll just do this tweak for you. And then you rely on natural selection then to to protect them. Um, so, you know, if, if it all goes well uh, and they and they actually it gives them really, really strong protection and they decide that they really like the taste of, of cane toads, uh, then they might actually act as a good, you know, repressor of the cane toad population. So, so it could be potentially a double win out of that, but a single <laughs> win would be, uh, a, <laughs> would be a good result as well. How far along are you in that pipeline? So, yeah, so this, this project is sort of, it's been around for, for a few years. Uh, it's had a few delays because uh, it, it's sort of difficult to get hold of uh, useful material for the for the quoll. So we've um, so basically we've had to rely on um, on having using cell lines from old individuals that have basically been euthanized because they're reaching the end of their life and they've been sort of put down because they're getting unhealthy. And and then using cell lines from very old individuals is not so not so useful because they they're not very not very good at sort of um, proliferating in culture not not so good for converting into a stem cell state. But um but you know but we have actually sort of produced um uh you know stem cells from from these cells uh and 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 um uh but but, but the problem is because they are old cells and they sort of they easily sort of acquire abnormalities with you know the chromosomes and things so they're, they're not useful for actually producing an animal so we need to sort of go back back to the drawing board and actually try to produce new cell lines uh from young animals and this requires sort of collaborations and field work and permits and everything to be able to have access to that material um to be able to do that work but it's it's progressing along and it's and it's well supported by the other research that's going on in the lab that we haven't talked about for thylacine de-extinction uh which is again all using um our marsupial um model species that we use which is the the fat tail dunnart and that's our that's our basically our marsupial equivalent of the labor laboratory mouse that um myself and, uh, and my colleague um, andrew pask and myself have, have been developing as a as a laboratory model for a few years and sequencing its genome and and that sort of thing and uh and that's unfortunately I and mean, we started working on the the Dunart, um a few years ago before you know the quoll project came along uh which was sort of something that I, was, I sort of developed when i was working with andrew and then the thylacine stuff that sort of was the funding that he attracted and he's been interested in thylacine for a few years um we were working on the Dunart long before that but then fortuitously the Dunart actually is sort of in the same Sort of family of marsupials, those carnivorous dasyurid marsupials, which means it's a, it's a perfect model uh, for these uh, for these other you know sort of projects that we have going on. So it was just mm. that was just luck, really. Mm. I'd like to say Let it was foresight, but really, yeah. Let's let's actually talk about the thylacine though, because I'm curious about this. So this is one of your other interests. Uh, so mm. de-extinction of uh, the thylacine. What makes mm. the Tasmanian tiger? a good candidate for this sort of uh bring back uh it's a good candidate because um first of all it's a fairly recent extinction um which means that um that, that it's, there's still an ecological niche sitting there waiting for it to go back into and so it died out in tasmania only about um 90 nearly 90 years ago uh and it only died out you know but most likely because of uh, extensive hunting, it was just sort of persecuted by 
by farmers and, and trappers and so forth because it had a bounty on its head. It developed a reputation, an unfair reputation, unfounded reputation as a, as a sheep killer. Uh, and and basically, by the time the the bounty was lifted and it was sort of decided, oh no, we want to protect these things, it, it was too late. It was it was already virtually gone. Uh, and um, and so it's just it's such a sad story. It's just it's such a you know because it's it's so different to you know because it doesn't have any really close relatives. It was our only apex marsupial predator uh, that we had in a in Australia. So it's sort of like really sat on its own in a sort of you know in the in the sort of um in the food chain um and in in the ecosystem and and just you know amazing to look at and it's such a um an awesome example of convergent evolution as well so convergent evolution is that evolutionary phenomenon where you get completely unrelated species um evolving to look very similar to each other so you know a superficial an example of that um say for example is a dolphin looks very superficially like a fish um you know superficially but you know it's 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 more closely related to us than it is to a fish because they live in a similar environment and they've sort of therefore you know, natural selection evolves uh, you know pushes them to have the same kind of body shape and that sort of thing there are lots of other examples there are for example um, moles there are lots of different mole-like um, uh, species um, around the world um, that are actually not related to each other uh, um, but but because they have a similar kind of lifestyle you know burrowing through the underground and basically living underground uh, uh that you know they they look the same and they all have the the, the name mole at the end so there's the, there's the european mole and there's the 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 star-nosed mole in africa and various different ones but they're not related to each other at all and then in australia we have of course the marsupial mole which you know most people haven't even heard of uh i i, I remember when i first heard of the marsupial mole it wasn't until i was an adult i don't think i would heard of it when i was a kid um i was just gobsmacked that we we have this animal that that looks like a mole and it's and it's 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 such a bizarre looking creature uh and it lives in the middle of nowhere out in the sandy desert so it's a little bit different to uh other moles um in that it, it sort of lives in in sort of more sand rather than soil so it actually the sand falls behind it as it kind of basically swims um you know swims through the sand un underground and so it doesn't form tunnels like like other moles do but basically just swims through the sand and and they're so rarely seen because they're in the middle of nowhere and they just stay underground uh it's really only uh i think when there's sort of you know floods and things like that that kind of bring bring them to the surface and they only ever get spotted once every couple of years um a specimen turns up uh and that's it so and so we don't really know how many of them there are whether the population is stable whether they they've suffered since you know the introduction of invasive species or not uh we don't really know anything about that but um so andrew Pask and I were very fortunate to get um, access to a, um, a museum specimen, a frozen specimen of the mole, um, just a, a few years ago, and 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 then we've actually then um, undertaken a, a genome sequencing project for the marsupial mm. mole, so that we can actually start learning about its biology, uh, um, you know, actually it's from its genome sequence, and and actually study all of the all of the genes that are. Um, that are implicated in this sort of convergent evolution sort of process. And we're actually about to publish a paper on this. It's actually just been um, written up and we've, we've done all the studies with collaborators and everything. And uh, that'll, that'll be out soon. So that's been a fun side project as well. I don't know how I got into that, but uh, I just can't help myself talking about moles. Well, <laughs> I'm actually curious though, do we not have a captive population? Of moles? No, they actually don't. They don't breed in captivity, uh, unfortunately. So any, oh, the, you know, the, the rare specimens that have actually been brought in and, and tried to be um, sort of you know, um, looked after in captivity, they just end up dying, sadly. So, um, yeah, so, uh, it, you know, if, if somebody could figure out how to, how to um, you know, at least keep them alive in captivity, let alone breed from them, um, goodness knows what the sort of conditions you'd have to provide for them to, to get them to breed. Um, but um, you know, if, <laughs> I mean, they would—they they wouldn't be a great display item in a zoo, of mm -hmm. course, because they'd just stay under the <laughs> under the sand the, the whole time, unless you could have some sort of a a glass, you know, like cabinet thing where where you can, you know, they come close to the glass and you can see occasionally you can see them. But um, um, yeah, but but yeah, I mean, it would be fascinating to be able just to understand more about their behaviour and their biology um, to. To actually just know so one of the, one of the parts of um our publication that's coming out soon and analyzing the genome is actually to try to get uh, an estimate of the population size um mm -hmm. because you can actually do that 
um, from um, from a genome, a single genome sequences. You can actually, it's 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 hocus pocus. There's some collaborators of ours who have sort of helped us to do this. Um, but there's a way of analysing the genome that actually, um, where you can, there's sort of a, a sort of a, 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 a vestige of um, their sort of um, evolutionary kind of population status, or it's back through time that's sort of preserved within the structure of their genome in sort of the order of the sort of you know variations in the genome. Don't ask me to explain the the, the statistics of, of of how it's uh, actually um, deduced. But uh, yeah, but we've actually been able to get um, um, an estimate of the population or the what we call the effective population size, because it's not the precise population size, because that depends on the level of inbreeding and dispersion that's happening in populations. But we can see basically the relative changes to the population that are occurring through history. And we can see that there were, you know, that there were quite high number, um, you know, in um, you know a, a million years ago, and then there was a sort of a crash sort of, uh, you know, more recently when the climate change and then there was another sort of drop that sort of apparently um, correlates with, with the arrival of humans, um, you know, um, 40 to 60,000 years ago uh, and that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's been a interesting sort of uh, um, exp explore exploration of their, of their biology just through their genome. I'm amazed you can do that with a single individual and you don't need to have a comparison between two, for, yeah, yeah. for instance. Yeah. And so what was the result then? How how large do you estimate the at least this subpoperation to um, be? The, <laughs> to bring up the, uh, the actual uh, um, the, the figures of that. Oh, sorry. So it was up until about uh, 50,000 years ago. So the estimated uh, effective population size, I'm not saying this is the actual population size, was up around um, 70,000 individuals. Um, mm -hmm. And then after about 50,000 years ago, it sort of, it sort of dropped down about 20,000 years ago, it dropped down to that's about um, 30,000 individuals. And then it sort of recovered a bit after that. And then it sort of decreased again until about 5,000 years ago, um, down to about uh, around 10,000 individuals. And then it's basically remained um, um, level since then. So it seems to have stabilized about 5,000 years ago. What that could correlate to, um, I mean, the, the dingo was introduced uh, to the mainland around 5,000 years ago um, or a bit longer. So maybe that, that sort of drop, yeah, no, the drop sort of happens a little bit earlier than that. So it doesn't really quite explain you know, the, the earlier drop, but it seems to have not really suffered anything, any changes since about 5,000 years ago. Uh, the European, on, on this kind of analysis, the, the impact of European settlement it doesn't have the resolution that would sort of come down to just mm -hmm. you know be able to um, determine just from the last two hundred years. It's more on the sort of thousands of years kind of time scale. Um, so, but there's no obvious sort of blip just in that past two hundred years. But it's yeah, we're not sure if it's really good enough resolution to to know. There are other methods that that we could use if we can get hold of um, uh, like analyze material from multiple different individuals, and you could actually sort of get there's a different kind of analysis that you could do to figure out what the population size change would, would might have been since European settlement. So that, that'll be really interesting um, sort of analysis to do, but that'll be a future study. It's like uh, genetic detective work. We initially, is, got, yeah, on, yeah. We initially got on to uh, this topic. I was asking about uh, the, thylacine, the thylacine and uh, its DNA profile. So th that is the next question I have is, is how complete uh, is our mapping of uh, the Tasmanian tiger genome? Right, it's um, it's it's pretty good. Um, like it's it's you know it's one of the, it's 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 a it's a it's a much better quality genome in terms of its completeness than a lot of the genomes that that were being produced of of living species, you know, say ten or fifteen years ago. Um, but I mean, genome, you know, sequencing technology and, and assembly technology is you know vastly improved in just in the last five years or so. And now we're getting these sort of re absolutely complete what we call telomere telomere kind of genome assembly is done. So, you know, it, it doesn't approach that, but it's it, it's actually a lot better than a lot of those early genomes that were being produced uh, around the world from lots of different species. So it's pretty good considering this was from a from a museum specimen. Um, but we're not finished with it yet. There's a lot more improvements that we can do. So, I mean, you know, assembling a genome, it's kind of like, um, you know, you've got, you've, got, you've got all these sort of short fragments, you know, reads of, of, of sequence that you've got to then sort of piece together and see where they overlap, uh, basically, to be able to sort of piece to, them together. And that, that's much easier to do if you have long 
um, sequence reads, which you can do with some of the newer technologies that are around, like PacBio and Nanopore sequencing. That because the, the the old fashioned sequencing was all sort of you know these short um, fragments that are you know like just a couple of hundred um, bases long. Um, now, because of the, the the museum specimen of that we used for the thylacine, because it was so old, all of the DNA is fragmented in the museum specimen. So we can't rely on the long read sequencing. We have to use the short read sequencing. In fact, it's, it's already been fragmented into those into those short fragments anyway, which is actually suited for those um, reads. So, so then when you're assembling that, the, the problem with assembling a genome is that genomes contain lots and lots of repetitive sequence like that there's the important bits you know that have all the protein coding genes and then between all that these these long stretches of just sequences that are just repeats repeat 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 so it's like in a jigsaw puzzle is the way andrew always sort of uh, um analogy always uses it's like a having a big jigsaw puzzle where where most of the jigsaw is just blue sky and you've got you've got all the you know you've, you've got your little bit of landscape down the bottom bottom with your features that you can sort of piece together which are the genes and then the rest you've got blue sky and you've um and you've just got to try and piece it all together and it's and it's a nightmare um so so that so that's so but it also means it's also kind of the, the probably the less important parts of the genome as well so it's the parts that we don't necessarily think we we might need even need to sort of do all the editing of the so the idea is would you be, be to use a done up genome basically and then edit that to turn it into a thylacine genome mm. um and that's you know obviously millions of you know differences that you need to sort of edit in um but we are sort of looking at ways of actually um trying to isolate you know some of the longer fragments that we have in in the museum specimens uh even though most of it's fragmented we can sort of separate it all and and even if only like one percent of of all of that dna is long fragments we just isolate just those long fragments we amplify those and just sequence those uh and that hopefully will provide them enough uh you know longer fragments to sort of piece together you know all the different parts of the genome that we haven't been able to mm. figure out where they where they fit in in the jigsaw and so yeah so that there'll be we'll be doing a lot of intensive work towards that over the over the next few years that we've got now all this sort of funding for uh, and so that'll be a lot of our effort is just trying to get it as close as possible to 100 percent. we may not get to get it to 100 percent, but i think we'll probably be able to get it uh near enough uh for for the purposes of what we're doing that will do, essentially produce you know effect a hundred percent phenotypically a hundred percent uh a thylacine you know, how many specimens do we have access to so how, how large uh, a population of museum specimens um yeah. so it's in it's in the order of a hundred or so i think i'm not i'm just sort of there's somebody else in the lab who's sort of more in charge of of like you know, cataloging where all these different specimens are and and um, and accessing them. A lot of them are, are just skins, uh, so pelts that have been sort of preserved, which we can get DNA from. But of course, they're you know they're contaminated with with bacteria and so forth. So they're not not really useful because there's so much contaminant DNA. They're not really useful mm -hmm. for de novo producing a genome assembly. So we're not using those you know for our main sort of genome assembly build we rely on the the preserved ethanol preserved sort of specimen there's there's one particular specimen um you know from the from the melbourne museum that's that's been our best specimen that we just always go back to and it produces it has the best quality dna so we rely on that one the most but we but there are other museum specimens around the world that will um you know fixed ones that will rely on as well so the ethanol fixed ones are better than the formalin fixed specimens mm -hmm. that preserves the dna better but the but it's but it is an important point about the um all the skins that are preserved even though they're contaminated with bacteria because that's a really good resource for um for basically assessing the biodiversity of this of the species the, the gen genetic um, diversity within the species now this this is this is a criticism i'll answer just in case you were going to sort of challenge me with this question anyway because so, so a lot of people do is that oh we're, yeah we'll produce this um you know this thylacine uh that um th there'll be just one individual um but then you know or two individuals obviously in a male and a female and they'll just be so inbred because they'll just have to mate with each other and the the population will just crash because they'll be just so horribly inbred so you know why are we even doing this um so my, my answer to that is basically um we would uh um where the, the idea is to use all of this genetic diversity from all of these skins so it doesn't matter there's all this bacterial sort of contamination we just sequence all the dna it's there we can identify um what are the thylacine specific parts of all of that um sequencing map that to our assembled genome that we have on, on the computer 
and and then so that we can use all that, all of those different skins to just get the full range of diversity across the genome. Now, genetic diversity in a population, you know, we, we have variants. Um, you know, you have sort of single base sort of differences that that we all have in particular genes. And you know, in breeding, you might have like a, a variation. Most of the time, that variation doesn't matter if it's a recessive gene. In other words, that means that if you have two copies of it, it'll be damaging. But if you have, you know, one the the normal copy, the 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 fit sort of version of it, then the unfit version won't matter because the dominant version will you know will be dominant, so you don't get any illness. When you have inbreeding, then that allows those those sort of deleterious kind of versions to sort of come together in the same individual. Um, because they share the sort of you know same parents and so forth, um, and um, and that's why you get disease in in uh, as resulting in inbreeding. But those recessive deleterious kind of alleles um, versions are always a minority uh, in the you know in the total diver um, diversity. So so there might be lots of of those re recessive alleles across the whole genome, but in but um, for a particular position in the genome. The deleterious ones are always going to be the minority of the population. They're always going to be the least represented. See what I mean? So if you do, if you do a full sort of survey across the genome, even though there are lots of deleterious ones, you can you can just basically um, bioinformatically filter out all of the less frequent variants, and then you, yeah, in on your computer you build a version of the genome, a new version of the assembly that only has the most commonly represented variant at every, at every single position in the genome and that is essentially a, a perfectly fit animal this is this is an animal that doesn't have that you could you could inbreed it as much as you like because there's there's no deleterious uh you know alleles at all uh present in the genome so you produce your male and your female uh you know with that based genome and that would actually be a fitter animal probably slightly fitter i wouldn't imagine hugely fitter but probably a slightly fitter animal than the original thylacines that were present uh, in the original population. And that would gradually build up then more genetic diversity over time because you get natural mutations that are occurring in a, in a genome all the time. So there's another argument though that, so that that's for a sort of, you know, the genes that sort of cover all, you know, sort of metabolic kind of things. But there's another um, reason that you need uh, genetic diversity in a particular set of genes, which are called the MHC genes or the major histocompatibility complex genes. And these are genes that are sort of, sort of associated with immunity that are kind of good for sort of robustness in a population protection against sort of diseases and that sort of thing. And that's where you want sort of genetic variation because you want lots of different variants of that. But that, that's a very discrete sort of pop, um, set of genes. And it's well understood, you know, the kind of genetic diversity that you would want to sort of you know, you could engineer that genetic diversity just in those MHC genes that would give that sort of, you know, robustness to protection against disease. And you could say, you know, you could use, you could take the MHC genes from from Tasmanian devils, for example, look at their diversity or or, or across other sort of dasyurid marsupials and just, you know, introduce a good range of diversity that will give the the, the natural, the, the, the new population of thylacines a good sort of protective diversity in the MHC um, composition. So there are, yeah, there are there are things we can do. Yeah. I suppose also there is genetic diversity in the fact how done it, and so you'd use that diversity as well on top of. Yeah, we uh, we uh, you mean in the MHC genes? Yeah, yeah, we could we could use the um. Yeah, so I we mean more generally, we, yeah, more generally. Yeah, um, yeah, in dasyurids in 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 general, um, you, you could yeah, you could basically you know, um. Perhaps even just you know sequence just one individual from each from lots of different dasyurid species and and just you know get a good selection of MHC. I mean it's not you know there's no the the it's it's not like the there are particular MHC you know variants that you that you must have. The important thing is more having diversity so that in the face of new diseases that you know there's diversity there to to give the species that robustness. But um, yeah, I, so there there are certainly um, it's 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 not something that's gonna that this this problem of inbreeding uh as a lot of people think is it's sort of the thing that makes or breaks the whole project it doesn't it doesn't uh break it at all in fact it, 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 we can actually exploit it probably make it make it even better uh, so to our advantage but but so what percentage uh do you need to reconstruct so so uh how mm. closely related is the tasmanian tiger to the fat tail done it or so or the... um um, so I'm not sure of the exact figure for how many sequence differences uh, 
they're going to be between say Dunnart uh, and the thylacine so there are others in the lab sort of who, who sort of analyze that sort of stuff more but we're talking in the order of millions of differences so that you know uh, from one perspective that could mean millions of edits uh you know if you're actually um using CRISPR to edit each of those differences independently and separately which seems like a obviously a um a mind-blowingly sort of um um uh, impossible sort of task um you know unless unless the um uh, the technology for doing it for multiplexing it basically um improves you know by orders of magnitude fairly quickly the other the other sort of um strategy um which is probably much more likely is that you don't you don't really sort of you know edit um lots or all, all of them in sort of you know individually you synthesize very long fragments of dna and and the the technology for se um, sequencing very long fragments at the moment it's just thousands but it will be sort of um you know in the future before too long uh millions of um nucleotide length fragments of dna uh and within that fragment there'll be lots of differences that you're introducing into the Dunnart genome so this if this is your thylacine fragment that you've had synthesized which itself contains lots and lots of individual sequence differences um, compared with the Dunnart and so so you basically then replace the the equivalent region in the Dunnart with that th um, thylacine fragment and you're basically then simultaneously sort of you know doing zillions of edits all at once just by having that big long synthetic fragment that you're just using mm -hmm. to 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 replace a part of the Dunnart genome and so then that would be require far fewer um um basic um you know actual events or changes and it's much more likely that the technology will get to that point um you know before too long where we can sort of you know start doing that more efficiently but it, you know it's it's still it's, it's still being done in our lab we're, we're actually not specifically working on um that that technology the the really efficient sort of CRISPR editing technology of you know doing the large um, um, number of changes or large fragments um, uh, of that sort of scale. That's that's more the the task of Colossal, so who are, who are funding us. Um, our our sort of side of the project that they're you know sort of helping to fund us for is more the reproductive biology, the uh, stem cell biology. So basically, producing the stem cells from the done art. Uh, that we then give to Colossal and then they do the edits in those stem cells. They give us the stem cells back that are now thylacine stem cells. And then we have to make an animal from those thylacine stem cells. So so we're developing the technologies for basically taking dasyurid stem cells and then creating an embryo from that, you know, putting it in a surrogate mother, you know, getting being able to raise it. And of course, you've got, you know, you've got the obvious problem that you've got. This is a, a, now a thylacine embryo that you've got to, you don't have a thylacine surrogate mother of course so what are you going to raise it in you know the sort of ideas of making um, artificial uteruses and so forth but a much um more likely scenario is that we would use a qual for example as a surrogate and one great advantage of doing this in in um, um the thylacine or in, in marsupials is it alluding to this question that you asked earlier about why the thylacine as being the best sort of um, species to be extinct apart from its ecological niche that i referred to it's actually the, the it, it's it's because it's born marsupials are born at this, this sort of tiny sort of stage of development um it's actually the, the fact that the, the thylacine is so much bigger than than all the other sort of closely related um dasyurid marsupials is not a problem because they all give birth to this tiny individual whether it's a thylacine uh it'll give birth to a that's you know or a, or a tasmanian devil or a dunnart it's all always this tiny individual because most of the growth that then occurs in the pouch so a quoll will quite happily give birth to a um uh, should quite happily give birth to a thylacine uh, young and uh, and then it will live in the pouch of the quoll for for until it outgrows the pouch and then we would then rely on on sort of hand rearing kind of uh, procedures that will also be sort of developing in our lab for that so that all of that sort of reproductive biology side of it and the stem cell biology is our is our side of things really the the dna editing thing which i think is the much harder bit that's that's a colossal task mm. and so in terms of actually raising well first of all conception and then raising has this been done in marsupials before have we had ivf carried out inside of a no yeah there've there've been sort of some sort of um attempts at ivf uh kind of procedures but but nothing that sort of really sort of um resulted in you know you know full on ivf and then transfer of the embryo and then and then um 
gestating to to birth and, and so forth that has not been achieved in uh, marsupials but the problem with you know this kind of research you know for, for decades you know there's been you know there's a lot of a lot of reproductive marsupial biology research but it's it's, it's you know generally dependent on sort of short-term grants you know three years sort of grants mm -hmm. and so a lab will get some funding to to work on this sort of thing and then they run out of funds after three years and then they sort of have to drop it and then they might get another grant a few years later or something so there's this sort of stop start um kind of you know funding <laughs> thing that you know that research is everywhere um you're a researcher you're probably aware of it um uh that you know suffer from uh and it's and and so the the game changer that that for us in our lab now with this long-term funding initially with the i mean the colossal is is, is initially a three-year grant but we've got from this other philanthropist who gave us um um 10 million dollars uh sorry five million dollars but spread out over 10 years uh that you know we we actually sort of specifically said to him look we would like this money spread out over 10 years not not all at once because that that longevity uh of funding is just it's just gold for for just being able to stick with a you know research project mm -hmm. uh and and just see it out <laughs> you know uh in in the you know in the long haul uh and um and that's that's why it's been such a fantastic opportunity and 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 then having that longevity sort of basically showed that we're th this project we're, we're in it for the long haul and that mm -hmm. essentially kind of I, I would think from colossal's perspective would would mean that they would sort of feel that they kind of you know that it's worth it for them and it's in it for them and it's in their best interests to support us in the long term as well because we're going to be working it on, on the long term and they they have a similar ambition for the for the actual outcome so they're they're much better off you know continuing to invest uh in in this for beyond the three years be, because of that so mm. so that's why i say this this is you know this is really sort of set ourselves up um you know for a really long term um and and the, the massive benefits that um this has generally for marsupial conservation biology as well this this is what i keep saying when when a lot of people sort of criticize the the, the funding they say well, all this money this bloody waste of money it should be all going towards uh conservation biology it's just irresponsible and, and you know the people who you know a lot of the people who are investing in this sort of stuff um you know I, I, most most billionaires they invest in in casinos and super yachts uh, and that sort of thing and here we've got you know a bunch of wealthy people who sure they love the idea of a de-extincted mammoth and a de-extincted um a thylacine but they're generally not the sort of people who would be just pouring millions and millions constantly into conservation biology uh you know so so this is this is all money that would never have got to conserv conservation biology in the first place and and but all of the technologies that we're developing um all just you know like the you know cryopreserving preserving cell lines from lots of individuals of threatened species as a, as a sort of a you know uh, a genetic resource for you know in case the population goes extinct or there's loss of genetic diversity and then the technologies for using those cells to to then produce new individuals uh essentially to restore the population and restore that genetic diversity all of that stuff is all technology we have to develop anyway for the mm. thylacine project uh but it's all integral to and it's important for the northern coral project of course as well which is why the you know northern coral project just slots in as a little sort of sub project within the thylacine mm. project absolutely perfectly and so that's you know that's what i always say to these people as, as soon as you explain it to them and you say you know then it is crystal clear it's like yeah okay uh, it, it makes perfect sense but you know you look in the media and you look at the you know the facebook um you know threads or whatever and everyone's just re <laughs> reacting to it and they're all just you know you know seething uh at uh the, the fact that all of this 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 money is going to 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 towards bringing back a thylacine when it ought to be going towards conservation they don't realize that actually it is it's going towards conservation and it never would otherwise um if it hadn't been put towards the thylacine project i've always found this argument really crazy considering how much money we spend on watching the kardashians or you know the, yeah. the, the place <laughs> where we yeah. shuttle our money yeah. towards is yeah 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 it, yeah, yeah. why not... <laughs> get angry about about that that the way that that money has landed in conservation biology <laughs> why get angry about that when you consider how much other money in the world is you know what a massive proportion of all the other money in the world is just spent on all this, this other rubbish yeah, yeah exactly so it's frustrating um having to sort of uh you know sort of you know, 
push that argument again and again and again. Um, but, um, but you know, it's, yeah, you got to do it. <laughs> but it seems to be working, right? Because you are getting grants. Yeah. You, you are starting to get some funding behind this, which is, which is a good sign. Yeah. Uh, well, at the moment, um, I mean, not, not, you know, we don't, we don't get public. Like I, I would never put in, um, you know, app, grant applications for a public, public money for a de-extension project. I, I don't think we'd ever have a chance. And if I were, if I were reviewing, um, a grant application for, for somebody else that's public money for, for a public uh, fund. I, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't give money um, for a de, you know, something that's specifically because I, I would rather, you know, give the project to a, to a well thought out conservation biology project. Uh, so, you know, and so we don't we don't really apply for public money anyway for this sort of stuff. We don't attempt to. But it's but in terms of the, you know, the, the the way we've been able to expand our uh, lab and the expertise i mean it's still early days because we've only just got all these funding and we're sort of going through this sort of expansion process which is kind of <laughs> a little bit disruptive uh, um for, for a while but uh you know in in an, in the year and we're going through you know grant applications sort of season at the moment hmm. but um but you know I, I certainly hope that in the next couple of years because of our um expanded capacity of the lab we'll be able to get um you know be able to do many more projects and apply for much more funding for these other kind of conservation related projects um and and be able to get those those public money grants for for that stuff as well uh, so i think it's yeah it's just looking looking really good um mm. for the future for that side of things in the lab so so what is the roadmap so i i should say i i'm gonna uh move towards wrapping up the conversation with a few final questions mm. but before that what is the roadmap and and what what do you what do you think the project's going to look like five ten uh, years from now? The thylacine project, yes, or yeah. yeah. Um, well, um, so the roadmap is um, yeah. So as, as I said before, it, it sort of depends a lot on on the progress of the DNA sequence of the DNA um, um, editing and you know synthetic DNA sort of um, um, sort of side of things. That's that's not sort of our area. But um, you know, we 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 already have um, you know, IPS cells. We've derived IPS cells in the lab. So IPS cells are these induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, they essentially have the properties of embryonic stem cells. So we've we've um, you know we've got that as a resource as a tool to sort of study. And we have to sort of understand these stem cells. We have to understand how we can use them, um, how how different they are to the kind of um, embryonic stem cells that you would have from mice, uh, for example, in humans. Uh, we 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 have to test. You know, the the capacity to if we inject those cells into an embryo, um, will they sort of contribute to the embryo and therefore to the to the young that's born um, from that embryo? So all of these things have to be figured out, and and that um, you know that you know three years from now, I think I think we should we should have um, been able to demonstrate some way of going from those stem cells to an individual. Uh, I think that's that's a pretty that's a pretty reasonable. It might take longer than that, but I think it's quite realistic that within three years there are several different strategies. Another strategy is you can sort of modify the you can convert those stem cells into germ cells. So basically, like the um, sperm producing cells, and then you, in in a culture dish, and then you sort of transplant those cells into the testis of an animal, uh, and then that animal will then produce sperm from those from those cells that are transplanted. So that's another way of get, basically getting from those cells in the dish to an actual animal. Um, mm -hmm. that, you know, contains those gene edits. So, there, so the, you know, in mice, there are lots of alternative of these kinds of strategies that are sort of being developed all the time. And so we're basically trying to really replicate those kind of strategies in, in the done Um And then at the same time in the lab, we have um, other things that are, um, so for, for the, so the lactation side of things, sort of, you know, figuring out how we can sort of raise um, artificially um animals that are in an early stage of development you know, in the pouch and then basically in an artificial pouch for example um and so and we and we're doing sort of analysis of the, of the milk so to see if we can actually produce um you know, artificial um milk that sort of replicates the very earliest sort of stages of marsupial um, milk because it sort of changes during during development um and yeah or we've got sort of yeah lots of these sort of parallel projects um some of the other ones, oh, of course, is the the genome sequencing. Um, you know, improving the uh, assembly. Um, so, so yeah, so there are lots of these sort of parallel projects going on in the lab in our in our team, and um, our, our and our main and our set of milestones is sort of basically from three years uh, from now. 
and that um yeah i mean there's i, I think we should be able to achieve most of those um you know we, this is science so you know you, you you can expect that you, you know, you're probably not going to achieve all of them, but we'll be pretty happy if we can achieve, you know, um, the majority of them. And and you know, Colossa would be, I'm sure they would be more than happy with with that progress that they would, you know, they would um, keep funding us for the long term, um, just mm-hmm. based on that. Um, and uh, also the yeah, and and the the, the Northern Qual will be a a real proof of principles for all of this as well. Um, so that's more sort of not so much funded by the colossal thing, but but our initial philanthropist um, uh, that gave us our initial pot of money because he's he's much more interested in the, in the conservation kind of benefits of all of this as well, um, and um, and so the the northern coal will be this is a proof of principle for all of this kind of stuff that um, that I would hope we can uh, it's it's a little bit with logistics of the husbandry of the coals and that sort of thing, um, but three to five years you know three years at best. Uh, to produce a northern coal that has the canto toxin resistance and mm. uh five years at, at worst um i think um but yeah that that's but about so as you, much of a road mapper uh, yeah yeah but so it sounds within your career within the span of your career mm. it sounds yeah. like it's highly likely that we will be seeing it's, it sounds like you're you mm. you feel as though it's highly likely that you will be able to produce a living animal thylacine um mm. I whether it's more than fifty percent chance. I mean, I, I I totally recognize the challenge of it. Um, I th- I think it. If if you ask me on one day, I might give a different answer than if you ask me on an, on another day what the what the percentage probability is. Um, before the funding came along, I obviously I used to think the probability was was just almost negligible, and then when the funding came along, I thought, wow, well maybe we can do this. Uh, <laughs> uh, and um, and also sort of you know started to sort of see a lot of the pr- progress that was made uh, in the CRISPR editing sort of synthetic biology sort of um, side of things, um, but yeah, I mean I'm more of the ten year kind of uh, uh, for me I would say I would say there's a twenty percent chance we could do it in ten years. Um, Andrew tends to be a lot more optimistic than that I think, um, and colossal way more optimistic uh than that so i'm an, i'm in the more cautious kind of side of things i don't want to i don't i don't like going out there and <laughs> saying yeah yeah for sure it'll 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 be a doddle in you know five years or anything like that um i'm because i know i know how how much sort of you know unexpected kind of um things can happen in research where that sort of holds things up for a while and you've got something you've just got to You've just got to natter away it for a while um, to to mm. figure it out, and um, yeah. So, uh, but but you know, it's it's the stability, having stability in the lab, like having having you know a good team that where we sort of you know, and and then the same sort of you know, we have our because we're doing this lab expansion. Once we have our you know big new lab expansion space, and we have a you know consistent team for a few years, then the efficiency should you know just really really pick up uh, at that. So. There's a lot of things that are hard to predict without all that, but that gives you some idea. I guess the truth is that even 30, 40 years ago, this sounded like science fiction, whereas now Mm. you can actually start setting down a roadmap. And so Mm. things really have changed in 10 years. Who knows? Uh, Maybe more funding is going to come in. Maybe other groups are going to join Colossus. Yeah. While we're while we're in the game of making predictions, uh, to hit back on the first topic, do you think Australia will ever be free of its invasive species? Do you think we'll ever get to a point where we can stop playing uh, around with these yes. games? Yes, yes, I do, because I think. Uh, do you mean a hundred percent eradication, or 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 you know, effective where, eradication? Where gets, yeah, we're to the point where. Yeah, where where species can recover. So, so I mean, to to actually go back to sort of what I was going to start talking about earlier, um, um, before we sort of came on air, um, was you know I was talking about my parents, um, you know, and and sort of their biologists and um and um having grown up on the farm. So my mother's um, uh, father, my grandfather, he grew up uh, on a farm near Shepparton. So you know, he was born in eighteen ninety seven. Uh, so you know, grew up in the early 1900s on, on a farm, and he used to uh, tell mum. Mum says that, that, that for, for when he was a kid, it was kind of nor- seeing a seeing a quoll was kind of not not an unusual thing for him. He you know 
he mentioned once that you know there was some sort of floods and he saw a, a quoll sitting on a fence post like up out of the water in, in broad daylight um and uh, that, that would have been an east oh, actually i'm not sure if that would have been an eastern quoll or a, or a tiger quoll actually um but um but i've never seen in, uh, a quoll in the wild in my life and I, I might never i've only ever seen them in zoos uh yet so that, but they used to be commonplace. They so just just to be you know all over the place. There were eastern quolls in the you know in Melbourne on the on the Yarra um, sort of you know study park kind of area until the nineteen sixties apparently. Um, but eastern quolls are just extinct uh, now on the mainland. Um, so it's it's been such a gradual. It's like the frog in the pot of boiling water. Basically, mm. we don't know what we've forgotten what normal is. But I, I, when I you know I, I, when I was growing up, it's normal to see rabbits running around. It's normal to see foxes it's normal to see all these invasive indian miners and everything that's that's all just normal and and i've grown up you know <laughs> thinking that that's not normal when it's not normal uh and and so we nobody realizes what's what's normal and my prediction is that once we get rid of all of these invasive species or even just 90 percent of the populations of, of all of these na native species all of these of other invasive species all of these native species should just naturally start to come back all of these little rare marsupials that hardly anyone ever sees that are just like restricted to these sort of local populations that it will just be natural they, they won't need any encouragement once you remove the invasive species that will you'll just go to a uh, a national park and you'll just have bandicoots running around your feet and maybe not around your feet but it, it it'll just become normal to see all of those marsupials um and and other species um, again, that that should be there. I mean, it's it's just normal, and it's what what my grandfather experienced. Even though a lot of species um, probably had become extinct even by the time he was a kid, but at least he was still seeing quolls. Um, and so that's that's my dream is to basically see see at least you know <laughs> a, a, a Australia on the path to heading to it. See that that is happening. Obviously, I you know I may not live long enough to to see the you know the, the 100 recovery but but i want to be able to see that that we're on a path to knowing that we're getting back to that a point again and that's that's why i switched career to this this field uh three or four years ago because i just thought this is this is just too good an opportunity and i just want to i just want to see that it happens uh it's kind of became the most important thing for me so yeah i i love the dream Let's finish on a positive note because I, I really like the image. Stephen Frankenberg, it was an absolute pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you very much for joining me. If I had not gone into physics, I totally would have gone down the path that you're going down, I think. I, I think it's one of the most important um, things that we could be working on right now, especially as Australians. So yeah, I, yeah. I, I, yeah, I really yeah, love that you too, have the for me, and, I, and I've sort of got myself kind of more into the engine like I've always been sort of basic biology kind of person whereas I actually come from a family of engineers like my brother studied engineering my grandfather the one that saw the quoll on the fence post he he became an engineer after he grew up on the farm my uncle's uh, an engineer uh, uh, until he went back to the farm uh, and um, yeah so I've got an engineering genes but then I studied sort of I was doing more fundamental biology research and that I now say I've actually I kind of enjoy the the engineering side of uh biology or the opportunity to do ng so i think it's it's probably in my genes i'm being a geneticist there obviously uh but i i think i was sort of predisposed to to, to being a, a bit of an engineer even though i did biology but found a way to do both so um yeah so it's sort of been an interesting career path that way as well and you, you mentioned that i'm sort of yeah i've had a quite a broad i've, I've always been sort of a, a a jack of all trades and a but a master of none with it because i always get distracted and interesting interested in other fields and um and i'm always just sort of wanting to you know sort of start dabbling in a, in another field that, that's mostly sort of in you know in the realms of sort of evolution and and reproductive biology and developmental biology and that sort of thing but but um when this um yeah gene drive sort of opportunity or idea sort of came along i thought wow it just ticks the box of pretty much every single one of those different fields that i've just sort of been dabbling with in for years you know the reproductive biology the embryology the genetics mm. the <laughs> the sort of you know uh, it, uh the evolution of course is uh and plus mm. even though i'm not you know i did undergraduate ecology sort of subjects and you know when i did zoology um but you know then i sort of you know branch more into sort of cell biology and more stuff like that but i you know i did do undergraduate 
um, ecology and evolution and all those sort of subjects and, you know, grew up in that sort of environment. So although I didn't have the, the formal sort of PhD level of training mm -hmm. for that, it's always been there, that interest and, the, and, and enough of an understanding of, of how it all works and that sort of thing. And being, being in a zoology, well, the, the, the building that I'm in now, it's, it's called, it's Biosciences 4, it's part of the Biosciences School, but it's actually the building that used to be the zoology building at Melbourne University. And it's where I did my, my undergrad and, and so forth as well. So I'm so so the people who are kind of in that building, they're ecologists and and evolutionary biologists, and so I'm, you know, I'm immersed in that kind of environment. I'm not I'm not you know just stuck with cell biologists as my, as my colleagues, um, and and that that was instrumental in sort of helping getting the funding as well because um, for the the Department of Ag funding for the gene drive stuff, um, because I was able to um, you know get the assistance from you know the like the the aquatic ecologist people in in the school. Who you know who, who who were able to help me with sort of you know with all that the carp say they said that the gene drive work that I'm doing sort of targeting carp they they were able to help me with all the aquaculture sort of side of stuff to support that application so yeah I've sort of been lucky you know with the right location facilities you know the the particular sort of um, yeah, fields that I've sort of been interested in in all just sort of planets aligned for I just thought this mm. yeah this is this is the this is the project for me so yeah. The thing I love about it is that you really are able with your research to look very fundamentally at how organisms function and work and how reproduction uh, works. But then at the other end of the scale, hopefully the dream is at the end of the day, you really will have an honest to God thylacine. <laughs> you know, it's, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's very, very hands on. Um, it's the sort of thing where at the end of your career, imagine yourself, you're 90 years old, you're 80 years old, and you look back at what you've accomplished and you can see a thylacine in, in the zoo. Yeah. That I think, or not even that, e even if that project isn't successful, but maybe you see the numbats that are running around or the eastern quoll, oh, yeah. quolls. You, it, yeah. It's something where you can really look back and, and say, I I did that. It, it it might that that will be something that feels mm -hmm. very good down the line. Yeah, I, I, I like I, I like I, that. I image. know <laughs> I know that will be a good feeling. I'm pretty sure that will be a good feeling. <laughs>